All right. Welcome, everyone. It is, uh, we are one minute in. So I'd like to thank you guys all for joining. We are live on Facebook. Uh, I'm joined by some awesome people in here. If you're in the waiting room, I'm letting everybody in as they join. Uh, if you're joining or if you're watching on Facebook, join us on June, on June, Zoom to participate in the conversation. I'm going to put the Zoom link in the uh, chat here. This is cool. I only done one of these, or I only did these like when I tried to be a real estate agent there for about 20 minutes. We do these during the during the pandemic. <laughs> All right. So Zoom link is on Facebook. If you're watching on the uh, Event Hawk Facebook page, if you're watching through a share, then you have to and, uh, But if you just mention in the comments, I'll just kind of try to moderate. As we're, well, I guess uh, I could just like sit right here. No, I just need to straddle this. So I will ask that if you guys don't have a question or if we're not enjoying, do keep yourself muted just out of respect for, for everybody else. But we're going to jump in, guys. So welcome. I'm Tariq. I'm joined by uh, Corona Bounce. We have Brian. We have Nick Glassett from the Jump Off. We have Alex Casio from Casio Insurance. Now we have Steve's going to be probably joining us in a bit here. I don't know if Steve is on here. Steve is joining right now. Steve is actually a, a, an, an interesting guest. I'd like to introduce you guys to. Definitely, uh, definitely something pretty cool. So uh, with that said, guys, uh, for those of you guys who, who don't, who, it's your first time on Zoom or you don't know us, this is for party rentals. we got a ton of people on here. So uh, again, do, do keep yourself muted, please. Uh, this purpose of today's uh, Zoom, today's roundtable, today's video is to do Party Rentals 101. We're gonna be talking about everything Party Rentals, everything from how to roll a bounce house to uh, which unit is best, to dollies, to insurance, to safety, whatever it is that you wanna talk about, that's what we're here for. In the past, I'm gonna share my screen. Last year, and this is where the idea came from, uh, I did the nine things webinar, okay? So last year, and Alex, you were in on this one, we did the nine things that every Party Rental business needs and the one you're probably forgetting. So we did this, uh, it's on YouTube right now. If you head over to the Netlock, um YouTube channel, or if you uh, text the word <coughs> off over to our phone number per the, um, uh, or just, you know what, just put it in the comments. If you want it, I'll send you this video. We got a ton of videos that are posted uh, in our Party Rental Business Success Kit. So in our Party Rental Business Success Kit, I got a ton of YouTube videos, free marketing crash courses. And then I have the nine things uh, is here. I just updated the thumbnail. I know Nick is laughing at my thumbnail. I'm not, not like you, Nick. I'll get there on for YouTube. <laughs> but uh, nine things. I'll rush through this real quick. We went through nine things that every party rental business needs just from talking to people. I'm not going to go through this again. I want to kind of open this to be roundtable. I don't want to talk the whole time. I want to give you guys an opportunity to talk. Well, let's see here. We said number one is having a phone number in your website. A lot of people don't have this. We noticed, so you want to make sure that your phone number is easy to access in the header of your website. This is the number one thing that a lot of people miss, and it is clickable and easy to um, to go ahead and call. Number two, we said having to Google My Business. Uh, and again, this is basic stuff, guys. Number three, having a Facebook page uh, without your logo, right, as people want to have, you know, your, your logo, not a bounce house because everybody has bounce houses. We also said that uh, having a booking software just makes it easy for people to be able to book online. I know a lot of people uh, will will use um, just Facebook or a website without a booking software like Wix or something like that. Dude, booking software, you go with one of these guys, you can't go wrong. Um, having a website, some stuff that you need for a website, domain name hosting. It seems complicated, but that's why when you go with one of these guys for your website, they'll do it all for you. Um, marketing, that's what we do. I'm not gonna go too much into marketing. But we talked about all the different things that you should do with marketing. Number one, <clears throat> make sure your website is optimized. Number two, drive traffic to your website. And number three, do some remarketing. And then we talked about insurance. That was number seven. Casio has the event hawk pop up on there. Any any uh, uh, insurance questions you guys have, head over to the Casio insurance website. You can ask. Uh, they'll be more than happy to help. Awesome, awesome guys. Whether you're customer, oh Casio, love you guys for what you guys do for the industry. Uh, and then we said number eight, license and registration. A lot of people will, uh, you know, are, are confused about this. So we went through the difference between an S corp, corp income tax. And it's all in the video. I know this is pretty rushed, but uh, again, this is all on YouTube. So just put it in the in the just mention in the comments that you want this YouTube video, and I'll send it over to you. 
And that's what we went through last year. We got a really, we got really, really great um, feedback on this. So we're, we've kind of decided to continue the conversation this year. Again, we're not going to go through all those things. It's a great video. I'll send it to you if you'd like to rewatch it. But for this year, uh, we would like to uh, kind of have it open for them and turn it around. So I'm going to go ahead and stop mm -hmm. my screen here. And we're going to do some quick introductions. There's a bunch of you guys. So I'm going to introduce the main speakers initially first. And then uh, we can go over and ask the questions. Steve, you there? I don't know if you I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Do you have a camera? We see you. Yeah. Start video. All right. While you do that, I'm going to start with. All uh, right. There he is. All right. Perfect. Another dude with no hair. My man. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, welcome, guys. I'm going to start with uh, with with Nick Glassett. Hey. First time on with us, so I'm going to start with him. Um, Nick here, he'll tell you a little bit about himself, but I'm going to tell you guys who Nick is to me. Uh, and Nick and I don't really talk much. He's, you know, we do, we've done business together. But we don't really talk much. The reason I invited Nick on here is to me, Nick is somebody that uh, I feel is the, uh, is a perfect example of a success story from somebody starting from scratch. Uh, this guy came in with his own style, with his, with just, he's making his own gear at this point, but, um, you know, he didn't, I'm going to tell you, to be honest, I feel like Nick is somebody that you should be looking up to modeling yourself after if you're starting out. When I started in this industry, there was this, this, this fad where if you wanted to be a millionaire, you had to do what the millionaires do. And that's what everybody did, right? There's these multi-million dollar companies out there. And it's like, hey, if they're making a couple million or, or they're making a million using with this party roll company. Let's do what they did and we'll, and, and we'll succeed like them. Problem is when they started out, they were marketing in yellow pages, right? So things were very different at the time. Um, so my, what I learned the hard way is that that simply doesn't work. You need to emulate uh, someone or you need to get mentored by someone. You need to follow someone who is just a couple steps ahead of you. Don't, don't follow somebody who's you know, 50 steps ahead of you. And that's who I feel Nick is for the newer guys. Uh, and, and Nick, you could do your own introduction. Sorry if I'm bashing you know, this out of proportion, but Nick, I, I'm not, I think he's, you've been in the business a year or two, but he's really doing amazing things. And he's somebody that I really do feel that uh, if you're newer, you can follow him because he was where you were very, very recently. I've been in this industry seven years. Uh, and if I were to tell you to do what I did when I started out, some of the advice that I give you may not be as relative anymore. But Nick is somebody that, uh, again, I do feel he has Discord, Facebook. He's all over Instagram. So he's doing you know things that, that, that I don't even understand at this point. But I'll turn it around to Nick. I'll have him do his introduction. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go next. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you. That was uh, that was very humbling. So thank you. Um, yeah. So basically, I've I've been in this industry roughly about two and a half years. Started with my wife. I had a corporate job. I was a district manager of or saw twenty five plus stores, et cetera, et cetera. My wife was tired of paying people like me, so she bought two units. I literally I don't even know if I've ever been on one when I started the jump off. Um, I scaled it. Um, it's pretty freaking big now. It's been two and a half years. Um, like Tariq said, I kind of just invented my own ways of doing everything. And that's kind of my style. And uh, eventually decided I wanted to start the YouTube channel to teach it all. And then it's gone bonkers from there. It's, it's really kind of crazy. Um, now I've launched uh, three different products, uh, two that are, you know, wraps that you put around your, your slides when they're um, all rolled up. So for storage, and then the other one is my rolling straps. That one I sell the most of. Um, and it's really just humbling, you know, Hearing everything from everyone, I get DMs all freaking day long from people asking me questions because that's what I say to do on my YouTube channel. I tell people just DM me any question. I reply to every DM. I reply to every comment on YouTube. That's what and that's do on my YouTube. I do all of that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that's about it. I just, you know, really wanted to kind of put some, I'll put it like this. I wanted to put some, what I felt was legitimacy to this industry where this industry, in my um, opinion, had been in kind of disarray. Just everybody doing everything. Nobody was given good advice. Everybody was kind of snarky and, and cynical. And I just said, you know what? If, if anybody's gonna do it, it's gotta be me. So then I started the YouTube channel and then away I had gone and it's gone great. <laughs> and, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you affiliated with anyone? I, I haven't seen this. Like Nick is kind of, he does his own thing. Usually when you see somebody doing something big, they're affiliated with like, I don't know, like, you know, Jump Orange or something like that. 
but you're you really you know you're really out there and you're everywhere who who are you who pays you to do these things or who are you affiliated with who sponsors you man i as of i mean i'm wearing a jump off shirt so somebody send me some shirts i'll wear some other shirts on here but uh no i don't i don't have any sponsors i don't really get any money from anything i have an affiliate link with um inflatable office so if you use my affiliate link, you know, there's a chance I might get a kickback from that. And then um, I've been working with Tommy at Rolls All. Um, we're kind of trying to work on kind of the same deal where if I refer you to buy a Rolls All, he's going to give me a little kickback. But I, I'm not like sponsored by anybody. I got no, no major checks rolling in. My pockets are not lined with anything. Um, I just, you know, I put out there the stuff that I use and I believe in you know, that's kind of where I, where I sit. It's like, I'm not going to go take money. I mean, I get DMS from, you know, Chinese manufacturers all day long. It's just like, no, thank you. I'm going to, I'm not doing this for the money. Put it that way. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing, Nick. Super excited to hear what you have to share. Um, next, we're going to go to Steve, Steve, uh, first time on with us. So, uh, Steve here is with an organization called Scioto. I don't know what it stands for right now, so I do apologize. But uh, I, I, when I started out, I, I came into, uh, I learned about the Facebook groups and I wanted to learn about how do you do this the right way? Like, I was scared, honestly. I seen the, the bounce houses flying away and I said, hey, is there like a safety course or something that I can take? Because I mean, this is a big uh, trust. You know, people are trusting us with their kids. So I, I, I looked and actually it was, uh, uh, Casio senior that I, I messaged or something. And he was like, Hey, there's a safety. I, I have a take my safety course at Scioto. And I said, Oh, there's a safety course. Perfect. So I did at the time it was part of Casio and I took the course. And uh, essentially what it was, was at the time, again, it was just a uh, kind of modules. You learn about staking and about uh, just doing things based on not what Tariq and Nick and, and Alex think it's based on, um, you know, the, 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 the actual, the right way, I guess, per se. So that's what Scioto was. It was some videos and some modules for you to actually learn about party rental safety. So that's what it was a while back. Steve is taking over now. So I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Tell us what is Scioto today? What is your involvement and what can we expect from that moving forward? Did we really just lose him? Maybe he didn't like what I had to say. You chased him off, Dorit. <laughs> it looked like he was having some connection issues, but I, I don't know if that's what kicked him off. All right, he'll, he'll rejoin then. So, all right, I guess floor is yours, Alex. So, Alex needs no introduction. Alex oh. is, is the insurance guy. So, uh, honestly, yeah, the... Alex, I met Alex in person at, uh, at uh, IAPA in Florida this past November. And honestly, man, breath of fresh air. The guy is not a salesman. So, I don't know how, <laughs> how sales are going for, uh, for, for your company, but very easy to talk to. Insurance is scary. Insurance is important. And uh, it's, it's really great to have somebody like Alex that you can just talk to and he'll just kind of tell you what it is. So turn it out to you, Alex. Tell us a bit about yourself. I appreciate that, Tariq. Yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure to meet you guys in person. It's, it's always nice to finally put a face to the name. Majority of our business, so everybody knows, we do very little in person. Uh, vast majority of our customers are out of the state. So if we ever get an opportunity to see you in person, we really do appreciate it. Uh, so if you ever do make it to IAPA, please stop by and just introduce yourselves and, and try to meet somebody on the team. Highly recommend doing that. Um, but a little bit about myself, I've uh, been a licensed insurance agent for 10 years now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, been involved in insurance my entire life. You know, my dad, he started the agency in 1987, basically specializing in anything that had to do with uh, amusement or recreation, any type of an activity where you really had to sign a waiver. That's basically what we specialized in for the last 20 plus years. So uh, my dad retired in 2020, uh, the end of 2020. So I came back to work for the company. Uh, so I've been back, I guess, for a little bit over about a year and a half now. So I've been learning a lot, trying to implement some changes. Um, you know, COVID obviously was a huge barrier or obstacle to get over. Uh, so we're kind of rebuilding from that just like everybody else. But um, yeah, it's been great. Honestly, appreciate all the support. You know, my dad's philosophy always for all the years was to get involved with the people who were brand new um, because it was very difficult for people that were brand new to get insurance. Uh, because they had no experience. So it was just kind of like being a, a fresh grad out of college. You have no way of getting a, a job because you don't have job experience. So uh, just one of those things that we really appreciate educating, giving you guys as much information, because we feel like if you have good habits and good practices starting out, you're going to continue to repeat that and scale that and just pass it on to your employees. So um, 
yeah, we, we really appreciate it though. Well, thank you, Alex. We appreciate you. Uh, and again, this guy probably, I mean, I definitely insurance more party rental companies have insurance with Casio than, than probably anyone else. So, uh, if you guys have insurance questions, then today's your lucky day. We're going to, this is, this is the time. Uh, and last, but definitely not least, and I'm hoping that Steve can join us uh, again here. We have Brian with Corona Bounce. Brian here is, uh, is again, somebody that I met at IAPA. Uh, again, Brian, you know, there's a lot of great manufacturers in this industry, amazing manufacturers, really. This industry is really close-knit. Uh, Brian here is actually unique because Brian is not only a manufacturer, but he's a party rental company owner, just like us. So uh, I'll let him tell his story, but uh, him having a little bit of both worlds uh, was really appealing to me because he gets the struggles that we go through when we're on those deliveries and stuff. So I'll turn it around to you, Brian. Hey, thanks Tariq. And uh, yeah, hello to everyone here. Nice to meet you all. Um, definitely like, yeah, what you were saying, I started in the party rental business. Uh, I'll make the story short about 10 years ago. So I was 20 and, you know, I know all the struggles that, uh, you know, I hear or the complaints I hear. And, you know, during COVID, I try to, when there was nothing to do in California, that's when I started manufacturing with one sewer who was my repairman. He really gave me the knowledge and on how it works, where to get everything, build relationships with other manufacturers. And I mean, within two years, you know, Corona Bounce just grew and grew and, um, yeah, it's been an amazing ride and, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's stressful, but you know, it, it's worth it at the end of the day when, you know, client replies, seeing, you know, their unit, they're happy and seeing kids enjoying, you know, your unit safely, of course, you know, um, you know, it's something, it's crazy. It's crazy. I learn every day. I keep my ears and eyes open as always. And, you know, I just try to imply what I, what I've been on the field with my crew when I was in the rental business. And I try to apply that to my units just to make life easier for, for everyone else. Because time is money in this business. So the faster we could roll up those units and take it to another house, the more money for us. And, and that's what I heard. I heard uh, your units are light. So that's, that's why I ordered from you. And somebody asked <laughs> where you did, uh, Corona is in Corona, California. That's where, uh, that's that's where it comes from. Not from coronavirus, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> they made it popular, though. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Well, thank you. It's very excited to hear uh, about some of the things that you're working on, Brian. And we have Steve back. So Steve, I did your little intro. So go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, Sayoto, and then we can jump into the uh, official presentation here. Sure. Sure. I appreciate that guys. And I apologize for that. I had a technical difficulty here, but um, we have a uh, party rental company that we started with about 12 years ago. Uh, I've always been a huge fan of uh, high quality and safety. Uh, big fan of SIOTO, which stands for Safe Inflatable Operator Training Organization. Uh, recently acquired the company about a month ago, and uh, we're going to be making some major enhancements uh, and bringing it to the masses here in the States as well as globally. All right. Well, thank you for that. Very, uh, very good to have somebody that we can ask. Again, my thing was always, are stakes supposed to go straight down or at an angle? Let's say, right? I, I did angle, but again, in the video, I remember I messaged your dad too. I messaged uh, uh, Casio Sr. And, and, and I was like, are you sure it's supposed to be straight down? He's like, yeah, that's 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 the right. Well, I mean, that was then. I'll, I'll let you guys, but uh, things like that, you know, it's good to have somebody that that you can actually uh, rely on that, you know, it's the information is coming from from the source. With that said, that is, uh, that's everyone we have for speakers, guys. So. Uh, again, I, I do not intend on making this uh, too structured or, or strict or anything like that. Uh, would really love to for, for all of us to kind of participate and hear from each other. So I, I have some topics I'm going to shoot off, and uh, and then you, we can, depending on how much interest there is in those topics, then we can we can kind of uh, move on. I, I, in full honesty, again, did not plan too much for this one because I wanted to keep it light and fun. But um, even from starting out. For I have, I put together kind of like 18 different points and I'm just going to go through them, starting with choosing a business name, choosing a business name. This one for a lot of us is too late for a lot of us either. It's like, oh man, I, I should have chose that name or you, you learned the hard way, but um, I'm going to give my input and then we'll kind of circle around, but choosing a business name. If you don't already have a business name, if you're starting out in a company and you're thinking about what, what name should I use? 
Uh, most of us have the word bounce in our name or jump or this or that. Um, from, from what I've learned, that actually is not the best idea. You know, if you look at Amazon, the word Amazon has nothing to do with what they do. Apple has nothing to do with phones. It's just something, it's just a brand. So uh, what happens is when you name yourself, you know, uh, you know, Orlando Bounce, once when you make your, you know, you choose a name where it's like a, a big city and, and, a, and a common word, uh, no matter how big you grow, whenever people are looking for you because they want to find you, it's like, oh, I want, you know, I want to go, I want to rent from Orlando Bounce. They're going to see every other bounce house company in Orlando. So uh, that's something, again, it's too late for a lot of us, but if you're starting out fresh, if you haven't picked a name yet, then uh, my advice would be don't pick something with a common keyword because then one day you're going to have a strong brand, right? And you're going to want to uh, people to find you. And when people type in Amazon, you're going to Amazon. There's no confusion. So when people type in your brand, you want it to go straight there. I learned my lesson with Event Hawk. So when we started Event Hawk, I made sure it was a unique name. Now, when when you type in Event Hawk, I'm the only company that comes up. Uh, there's no there's no confusion. I didn't call it you know party rental marketing or something like that. So everybody else can come up. So that would be my advice on that. Again, I got a few points, so I'll I'll kind of turn it around to you guys. Anybody from uh, the speakers here have any input on on names? And then we'll turn it around to uh, to questions, and then we'll go to the next point. I, uh, uh, first, can you go first on names, please? <laughs> <laughs> if, if you guys ahead, are are calling your insurance or anybody really, and you have a different spelling of your name, please like let us know that because sometimes you call in, you're like, yeah, it's jump and bounce, but it's like jump and then a dash and then the letter N and then bounce, so it's like. We're like trying for 15 minutes trying to figure out who the hell you are. So please, if you have a very unique spelling of your name, please make sure that you, you understand that we don't know what, the, what that is. So please help us out. <laughs> oh, how about how about putting your last name in your name, like Casio? And, and now, now that you're the next generation, what do you think? Will, will the next generation appreciate that? It'll be like, oh man, I can't get away from this. Well, that's the thing though, is it's, you know, Brown and Brown bought it, so. They can change it to the name, whatever they want to change it. You know, it's not the small family-owned business anymore. Um, unfortunately, there's some things that are good about being part of a larger organization like that. You know, it's it's a little bit more structured, but there are a lot of drawbacks, as Nick probably can tell you, about corporate America. So um, I, in some, some ways, I really do miss the small business feel because we did have a lot more flexibility in some ways. But a lot of other ways, it's like, man, it's, it's pretty frustrating. <laughs> but... Well, yeah. congrats on so, so there's that. So, yeah. Nick, what do you have on names? So I, I always tell people, um, you know, and I, I think your advice is good because yours is, you know, SEO advice. So I think that's super awesome to have that. Uh, but my advice always is take some time, think about it, but it's a kid. Your business is your other child. And so you need to name your other child something that you're going to be proud to say something that's going to represent you well and comes from a place where you're going to be mega proud to, you know, hand that business card or say that name or wear that shirt, whatever. Mine is actually named after Wu-Tang lyrics, believe it or not. It's not, has nothing to do with jumping inside of a bounce house or anything. It just kind of, you know, once I got bigger in this industry, I'm like, Jesus, everybody's got jump in the name and there's a song of mine. And yeah, I learned the hard way too of what you're saying, but, but uh, no, just, it's your next business is your next kid. So name it something that you're going to be proud of and have fun. God, have fun. I like that. Have fun. Name it like you're naming your kid. Very true. But, okay. How, hey, what about, Steve here. Hey, Steve. Good. I, I think you bring up a great point when it comes to the branding piece. Um, like Nick mentioned right now is, is you got, that is your baby. So what are the core equities that that business name represents? If it's value, if it's customer service, high quality, peace of mind. Um, so it's important that you really think through the name because your goal is to blow this up and go big. And you also got to stand out from that competition. So the name selection is very important. 100%. Something unique. I, I think if I had to, something unique would be the unique and easy to remember. Should be the, the uh, I would say the the key takeaways 
but not necessarily with key terms. Brian, what do you got, man? You, you're Corona bound. So Brian is actually the opposite, where he named himself something unique, and then and then now it's <laughs> everywhere. And now it's you can't even market the word Corona. If you were to run a Google ad, <laughs> it's Corona bounce. It's like, nope, we're taking that down. You can't talk about Corona. So yeah, no, I, 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 what you guys are mentioning is something I never even consider. I just went straight to the point. I was like, okay, I'm in the city of Corona and I make bounce houses, Corona bounce. I wasn't even second thought, you know, it was easy playing for me. I'm straight to the point. It's that it's here, but then COVID hit and it helped. It was free advertising without wanting it. <laughs> well, no, nobody could forget Corona bounce. No, no. <laughs> All right. Anybody have questions on names before we go into the next topic? So uh, there's a ton of people here, so there's no way I can get to everybody. So just unmute yourself and ask uh, whatever you want to ask. To You could direct it to a certain person or you could just ask generally uh, and then we'll, we'll move on. Anyone? Heard some background noise. All right, so it looks like, again, most of us already have our names picked out, so. Um, hey, Tariq, I got one more thing on names. Um, sure. If you guys are applying for your insurance, make sure that you already have your business name already picked out. Um, it's a lot more difficult to go back and change the name after you've already applied for the insurance. So if you guys have already thought about the name you want, you've already you know put in the paperwork for the LLC or the S Corp, or whatever the, the DBA even, uh, just make sure that you have that done before the insurance. I know a lot of people will call in before They've already started the business because they just want to have some information, um, but just want to throw that out there. It makes things a little bit easier if you guys do that. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Kayla. Um, as far as insurance goes, do you insure as a business or is each unit insured? Well, it, it depends on the policy type, but in general, it's the business um, so like your general liability and your accident coverage is based on your sales and then you're in the Marine, which is the coverage on the equipment itself. That's based on the value. Um, so it, it really did kind of goes hand in hand, but it's not on a per unit basis necessarily. Most of the time I would say, uh, but if you had high risk items, like a mechanical bull, there could be a flat charge just because you have a mechanical bull. Um, same thing with some of the other high risk items, like a, like a bungee trampoline or a zip line or something like that. I've seen somebody charge a flat charge just for that particular item. I see. Um, do you, can you share your number? Oh yeah, so. sure. Okay. So we will, we do, we will have a topic on, uh, I'm sure we have insurance. Yep. On our, all right, let's go to something more fun. This is this is one that that's big. choosing your inventory and equipment for your business. What should you start out with? What should you buy when? When should you buy what? So I'm gonna I'm gonna start. You got a lot of different things. You got bounce houses, water slides, combos, obstacle courses, mechanical bulls, tents, foam machines, all this stuff. And um, Again, uh, you're hearing from me after making seven years of mistakes. That's I don't I don't say I have seven years experience. I say I have seven years of mistakes. So uh, you can bypass those mistakes by listening to somebody like me and each one of us really. Uh, for me, I, I if I could go back, I always say whenever people ask, I would only buy wet dry combos for the first X amount of units. Those go out every single weekend, especially in summer. I have maybe 10 bounce houses. They don't go out in the summer because everybody wants something wet with a slide. I'll, I'll discount them. I'll beg, hey, do you have anything available? Yeah, I got 10 bounce. Nope, I want a slide. So uh, not to say bounce houses won't rent, but during those peak months when you want to sell out, you're going to look in your warehouse when you have a warehouse and you're going to find everything is gone except those dry units. So my advice would be, uh, number one, try to only your first few units let them only be wet dry, bounce house, wet, dry bounce house combos because those can go out when it's cold, they can go out when it's hot, they can go out with a slide, or they can go out just as a regular bounce house. Uh, the other thing, I, and this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but when I started, I looked at my competitors. I said, hey, they got a bounce house, they got a water slide, they got a combo, they got concessions, they have an obstacle course. I'm gonna do the same thing. Big mistake because half of that stuff sits uh, if you have a garage, right, you're starting from your house, 
you have, let's say you have enough space for five units. You want those five units to be frequent renters, especially if you're new. <clears throat> Obstacle courses do not go out every weekend. Speaking from my experience, maybe others have different experience. I mean, my, my combos sell out every weekend. My obstacle courses do not. If I have 10 obstacle courses, they don't all go out. So you want to think about if your goal is to quit your full-time job or to grow your business or to, to, to make enough to where you can get a warehouse or grow your inventory, your first few units should be frequent renters. Don't get a joust. Don't get a mechanic. I mean, mechanical bull could be frequent, I guess. I don't, I don't have one, so I wouldn't know. But um, that, that's, that's kind of where I want to start there. Just uh, when I started, I wanted one of everything because – out of 50 calls, I got one call that said, hey, I want an obstacle course. And I was like, man, I don't have one. I'm going to go buy one. And then I buy one, and then I don't get calls for it, of course, anymore. Uh, so so that's, that, that was my big thing. Uh, right now, our plan is actually to switch back to only combos. We're getting rid of all of our bounce houses. We have a two-year plan to just switch everything back. So that's, again, uh, we could have made a lot more money if our stuff wasn't sitting. So that would be my biggest advice. Uh, Nick, you want to go? Yeah, I suggest, you know, everybody's financial situation is different. So if you've got a windfall of money that you come into, or you've just been good with money, then go buy a bunch of new stuff. I'm a huge fan of buying used stuff. Um, as I get bigger and bigger, I do it less and less. Now I'm only buying used stuff I can find where, you know, but I just jump on marketplace and type in water slide and then do a filter for $1,245. So that way the one, two, three, four price point is filtered out. And then you can just scroll through and just go find. There's a ton of garbage in there. There's a ton of overpriced stuff in there, but you can come across good stuff that you can get way cheaper from someone who's getting out of the business. Somebody who didn't know what they were getting themselves into, whatever. I'm a big, big, big fan of buying used. Just of course, of course, be careful. And then once you've got income coming in, start supplementing and buying a few new while still staying used. And then as it goes on, just flip. So that's where I'm at now. It's flipped. I, I do not buy that many used units anymore. But I mean, I have three magic jump units I got for 1200 bucks for three units that are in perfect condition. Because it, wow. I stayed looking. I stayed looking. And the combo, well, two of them are bounce houses. To, so to your point, they do not go out that often. Um, but the combo, I mean, right? It was 300 bucks for 400 bucks. And it goes out every freaking weekend. It's dry only, so it'll stop. But it goes out every freaking weekend for 180 bucks, and I got it for 400, right? So just stay looking, and and you'll find good stuff. Advice. So, um, do you have advice on? I mean, what what else? Do you have anything other than combos and bounce houses? What do you? What would you? What would so you tell us? To start with. I guess we had some. Of right. Stuff. So I'm in a much different area of the country than you are. So that's a good question. My obstacle courses are fire. It, it's my, I have one 60 footer um, that makes the most money of anything in my fleet. It's ridiculous. And it's, it's dry only. So it can't even go out in the summer. And it's just every weekend, it just goes out once, sometimes twice. It's bonkers. I'm trying to get some more, right? But everybody's inventory is super low. But what you said with combos is, is head on. I mean, I have one bounce house that's an orange dinosaur that I still have because I started the company with it. So I just keep buying a new one when the old one wears out because it's nostalgic. And then I have those two bounce houses I got uh, in that, those magic jump ones. And then I'm not buying a bounce house probably ever again because they're, the money is low, right? So the workload is similar. The money is low. And then they just sit in the freaking storage. It's just ridiculous. So combos, combos, combos. And then... Water slides for me, water slides earn more money than combos. So as, as I have scaled now, I'm going a little bit heavier water slide because it's going to make, right? Because I don't need to worry about getting through winter. I have enough combos to go out in winter to where I don't need to continue uh, stockpiling those. Water slides are going to make me more money where I'm at because my water slide season, you know, is basically Easter to Labor Day. That's a good point. So yeah, you get water slides. You can't use them in the winter, but if you have a combo, and then you can use it in those uh, fall, spring. So we're good. Brian, what you got, man? You're the one that makes this stuff. So again, Brian, for those of you guys who joined late, Brian with Corona Bounce uh, manufactures bounce houses and combos. So what do you think when what are, what are people calling you about all the time? Or what do you like if somebody calls you and says, "Hey, Brian, what should I start out with?" What what do you think? 
Definitely, definitely. Number one sales are combos and water slides. Um, bounce house castles are very rare. Uh, I always suggest, oh, it depends on your budget, of course. There's a lot of people that want to splurge a lot of money and new units. And is there just first timers? I do advise them, like, maybe, you know, test the water out with something you use or, you know, not don't blow it all on me right now, even though I'll gladly be happy with that. But it's not the best advice. I tell them, you know, this is a weekend job. You, you, you know, you're, stay not right gonna have, you're not going to have weekends available. And, and, you know, that's a lot of money you're investing if you don't like it. So... That's my first advice, but of course, yeah, client. If they, but then if they're into it, I always tell get a combo, wet and dry, that in, that takes you the whole season. You know, winter and winter and summer, and if you're buying around March, I would always suggest you got to get a water slide, minimum a 15 footer, good income, um, nice. You know, they're a good size. Everybody's happy, and you know, it's not where it's too heavy, not where you can't move it all around. There's a lot of people that just also invest in mega slides. And it's the first time and they just hate it because it's too heavy. Instead of starting smaller than just growing, um, you know, I, I do that. That's my suggestion. Combos and water size, you can't go wrong there. And if you don't like the business and you want to resell them, those are hot items. You know, they always have a good resale value. No one's going to try to lowball you. What, what was that, Tariq? I said, I said they're, they're good resale value unless Nick finds you. He's paying third somehow. <laughs> yeah, Nick, don't, don't resell your LSU unit that we're making for you. Oh, bro, I'm so stoked for that. You have no idea. I've been hyping it up. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what are your thoughts on, uh, on units? Well, there's a lot of different things when it comes to insurance. Yeah, so I guess I'll tackle a couple things just because you guys brought up used equipment. Um, so my, my biggest advice on used equipment is to make sure that you get all the information on that used equipment before you buy it. Um, because as soon as you buy that unit, you're not going to hear from that person ever again. So if you're like, oh, what's the manufacturer that you're made? They're not going to give it to you. So get that information before you you actually sign on the dotted line and send money. Uh, so the, the year it was made, the manufacturer dimensions, if it has a serial number, great. Um, if you can't find one on the unit itself, you can always assign your own using your company initials and like a number sequence. Um, so just my, my advice on that was just make sure you get the, the information up front. There's not really a big issue with buying used equipment. Um, I would say the rule of thumb is to never get anything that's over five years old, uh, just from an insurance perspective. Uh, usually when it comes to the inland marine, even the coverage on the equipment itself, if it's five years or older, they're usually going to give you actual cash value, which includes depreciation versus five years or newer. They're going to give you replacement costs, which is much better coverage. Uh, so that includes, Shipping. I mean, basically, if you had to replace that unit with a similar or a new version of that unit, they would give you that full amount. They wouldn't even factor in depreciation. So uh, that's just my advice on used equipment. Um, I get a lot of questions all the time, actually, about you know what equipment is best or you know what equipment should I stay away from. Um, so my my question or my response to that is just you know what do you do you want to pay more or do you want to pay less for your insurance because there's a few things that you can stay away from if you're trying to keep your initial premiums lower. Um, so just jotting them down. The the big trend now is the the wedding or the open front bounce houses. For whatever reason, these have become a huge trend for completely new businesses. And I'm like, this is like the most risky bounce house you guys can buy. So. I don't know why that happened. Uh, I think it's just because you could take really good, cool pictures and stuff like that. It's not that they're uninsurable. It's just that you're going to have a higher floor that you're going to start out at. Um, in fact, the one company that we use that will even write it, they require that you have the Scioto training. So Steve, you're getting a lot of people from Berkeley Aspire <laughs> that are they're coming to you just to even get the insurance. They have to have that, that safety certification. Um, they don't want to see any adults and kids jumping in them at the same time. And especially if you're doing the wedding bouncers, keep in mind, underwriters know that there's going to be alcohol at weddings. So if that's the target demographic that you're going after, you're probably going to chase away a lot of the preferred markets that are probably going to be a lower premium for you. Um, so that's just my thoughts on wedding bouncers. Again, not, not a knock against them, not an issue at all to insure them. It's just going to be more expensive to start out. Um, other thing is mechanical rides. If you guys are trying to keep your premium as low as possible, Stay away from mechanical bulls. I know that you can get a really good deal on them on Facebook Marketplace. Um, it might be for a reason. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, again, not an issue to get insurance, but unless you want to spend more money on your insurance, I would stay away from it. 
um, at least just starting out. You know, they're really good renters for corporate events and big school events and stuff like that. But if your target market is just backyard birthday parties, that might not be a good fit or it's not going to be super cost effective for you from an insurance standpoint. Um, other things about inventory, make sure you guys keep a good list of your inventory moving forward. What we have when you go through the application process, we put everything on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet. So that way you can update it as you need to. You can send us the updated version. And you have a, a copy on file for yourself. Um, that way, you know, maybe you guys get a sweetheart deal. Someone wants to buy your business. You have an inventory list ready to go. So something to consider. Keep really good track of your inventory. If you guys are buying tables and chairs and stuff like that, make sure you let your insurance people know. Um, do it before you buy it. <laughs> Don't, don't buy a mechanical bull and then be like, hey, I got this bull. I need to get insured because you might be shocked at how much it costs to insure it. So I just want to throw that out there. Very, very good points. Steve, your thoughts on equipment? Yeah, those are great points that everyone shared. Uh, when I started with, with the party rental business, I started with a, with a mod. Uh, I didn't have that much money. And what I did is I purchased a mod and I got a couple banners and i came across as if i had 10 jumpers when i only had one uh so if you're depending on your budget uh think through what your customer base or your target customer is going to be if you're going after backyard parties think about some of the upsells that you want to add to increase your your average ticket if that's a concession or, or tables and chairs you may want to incorporate that into your inventory one of the things that Nick mentioned, uh, as far as buying used equipment, that I think is very important is to be very careful as you're shopping out in the marketplace or offer up or Craigslist. Um, from a safety perspective or standpoint, you wanna make sure that you are inspecting that uh, equipment thoroughly inside and out. Uh, look, at the, uh, look at the netting, look to see if there's any repairs, any, any holes, mold, or damage to the unit uh, because you want to minimize risk as much as possible. You don't want to put a, a unit out there that has a high risk of causing an accident. And I think that, uh, that Alex also brought up some great points as far as that, that training is concerned. You want to make sure that whatever unit you're going to go out and purchase or inventory you're going to go out and purchase, you want to make sure it's manageable for you and your team. You don't want to go out and purchase a, a huge water slide um, that's going to be uh, too much for your team to handle. But as far as starting off, uh, I would definitely start off with wet units. Uh, uh, I wish I would have started off with water slides from the very beginning, uh, but anything that's water has always been a big moneymaker. Thank you for that. Just, I guess one more, th one more thing on equipment, because I, I do feel like we have a lucky position just to see what works and what doesn't, because we see you know, hundreds if not thousands of these these new startups every year. Um, and like everyone's saying, the combo units, the ones who have combo units versus the ones who start out with bounce houses typically do much better in their first or second years. And that's that's just typically what we see historical data on. Um, so highly recommended if you guys are looking to get started, absolutely combos, wet, dry units, water slides if you're in the Southeast, absolutely have a bunch of those. Your insurance will go up, but you'll make a lot more money. <laughs> there you go. Spend, spend money to make money. All right. So hey, let's turn it hey. out to you guys. Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself if you have a question. Again, I'm not going to call uh, names. So if you have a question about equipment, what equipment you should buy, uh, what's profitable, what's not, what's safer, what's insurance-wise, any anything equipment-related, go ahead and ask. Hey Casio, can you um, share your um, your inventory um, uh, sheet? Yeah, that's no problem. Um, let me see if I can pull it in here. I have to remote in, but yeah, I'll, I'll um, I think if I could put it in the chat, I'll, I'll send it there. If not, I think I can do it actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat here. See, if everybody has it. Thank you. The good thing about using the one that I'm going to put in the chat is that when you guys are going through the application process, you could just upload that. You don't have to type in each individual item. So it should save you some time on the application process. Someone on Facebook asked, can the crossover units from Amazon be insured and rented? 
I don't know what they mean by crossover. I think they mean like maybe part commercial part. Exactly. That's exactly what yeah. it is. So the, the new trend again is, is going to be that the, the base or like the high traffic areas of the unit are going to be at least 15 ounce vinyl. And then maybe like the sidewalls or something or a lesser vinyl. It's, it's not an issue as long as the base and the high traffic areas are at least 15 ounce vinyl. That's the, the absolute minimum that we can do to get any type of insurance on those units. If you guys have any units that are not commercial grade, where it's like just the Oxford nylon, absolutely can't do anything for you on that one. Uh, that's something that I cannot help with. Um, Casio, what is the best type of insurance for having meetings at like groups that who does a lot at the parks, events at parks? It's the same insurance as you would have for your um, backyard birthday parties or your corporate events. It's just that you have to do the paperwork a little bit differently. Um, so for anything that's not a backyard birthday party, you have to have what we call the waiver signage. You might have heard it called pay for play, uh, but it's yeah. basically just like the, the very basic rule set. And then at the bottom of it, it has the hold harmless provision from your, your waiver. It's basically like your waiver. Uh, just because if you have an event like that, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get everybody to sign a waiver. But you at least have to let them know that, hey, here's the basic rules. Here's what you're going to you're going to be holding our company harmless if you get injured on it. And at least has to be posted in front of every single unit that you have at those type of an event. Um, we always, always recommend that you have pictures to document everything. So you have a picture showing that you had that sign posted. Um, take before and afterwards uh, pictures because that really does help for the documentation or God forbid there was an injury and they say, oh, I did a backflip and, you know, I hurt my neck and now I'm going to come sue you for it. We'll be like, hey, look, the rule says that you're not supposed to cut a backflip, man. What are you doing over here? Uh, but people will always try to come after you, especially if you're in states like Florida, New York, New Jersey, California, even Louisiana. Uh, a lot of lawsuits filed for some things that are completely self-inflicted and you're like, what are you guys doing? And they win. So just keep that in mind is like a lot of times it's, it may not be something that you're doing wrong. It's just a, it's just a business decision for the insurance company. So try to remove yourself from that as much as possible. Um, you know, give the waiver signage. If there's an injury, offer the accident policy for any type of medical bills that they have out of pocket, avoid as many lawsuits as you possibly can, because that's the best possible path to keep your insurance as low as possible. Thank you for that. Yeah, parks are not always fun. No, oh, yeah. Uh, another thing on parks too, sometimes it can be a huge pain in the butt to get certificates for the parks because they may have some very specific requirements. Um, more recent developments or requirements have been that people have been, uh, or parks, um, I've seen some in Illinois, I've seen some in, in um, Florida where they're requiring that you have additional coverage that you may not currently have. So if you, you, know, you don't have a workers' comp policy, you don't have a commercial auto policy, um, you don't have sexual abuse and molestation coverage, I've seen that as a requirement as well, which is, you know, I think if you're doing schoolwork and stuff like that, that seems you know, on, on par for the course, but um, there's just a lot of things that you may need. So if you guys know you're going to set up at a park, usually they have a template or a sample document of what they require on the additional insured certificate. So if you have a copy of like the PDF or a, a JPEG or a PNG file, you can upload that with the request when you guys are going through the additional insured certificate process. All right, thank you for that. Uh, if nobody has any questions about equipment or uh, inventory, then we can jump over. Yes, yes I, I just wanted to kind of, uh, pick your brain. So I was looking to kind of maybe get into like a niche, uh, just do purely out of, out of logistics. I don't have like a truck or a trailer just yet. So I was thinking of uh, definitely starting small, but I wanted to know in your experience, if there's any profitability and just focusing like per se, or like on toddlers or uh, I guess like on smaller units for, for that kind of audience. You just mean for like a profitability you mean for what do you what do you mean so like it it for anyone that has had experience within that niche has it been profitable for you and then also uh i guess what, what do you recommend for like logistics if you're just starting out like did did you get like a company vehicle just for this purpose or uh, did you like rent out a, a truck or how, how did you guys go about it when you started stuffed it in the back of my wife's armada 
<laughs> Put it on top of a hot there. Six. Yeah, bro. You get the unit there. You do what you got to do. Uh, are you talking? Are you talking toddler? Like when you say that, are you talking this new thing I've seen? Soft play, where like you set up a little fence and there's like balls and then a nylon bounce house. Is that what you mean? Not necessarily soft play, but more of like like I guess like smaller obstacle courses, smaller uh, combo units things of that nature still still like bounce houses but not soft play i have i have one toddler uh combo that's dry only right and what makes it toddler is it's got low walls and no roof so that the parents can stand around and see the kids jumping inside um it's fine it's yeah it does it does fine it's it's not uh my best performing combo by any stretch but i'll tell you this i don't know if you have one yet or not but dude it's not smaller than my big combos like it's it's my hec combos that are my um, probably my most regular renters. I have, my newest HEC combo is smaller than that toddler combo, and it's a wet dry unit that goes for two thirty. And that toddler one, I'm only getting one eight one fifty five right now for it. I think I just raised the price on it. So I just I don't think it's um, I don't think it's a barrier that you need to worry about. I think you should take Tariq's advice, get a get a wet dry combo, and just go go for real whether you gotta you know however you gotta get it there you gotta figure that part out obviously but yeah it's just not that much smaller cool thank you i have a question um, I a I, on, uh, trucks. sorry one second I, I got a whole section on this an area i struggled with i never had a truck in my life so until i got into this and it was tough you know it's one thing to spend 20 grand buying inflatables but to spend 20 or 30 grand on a truck it's like like that's just for the truck, right? Before I put anything in it. So uh, we'll talk more about that if you want to stick around. I think that's in a couple of points. I'm sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you. So I jumped head first in, in this. So I actually have um, three uh, inflatables, two obstacle courses and one uh, moonwalk. And that's where I'm at right now, trying to find a vehicle, uh, draw up a contract waiver, and insurance and so it's just like kind of overwhelming right now um i don't know you were talking about having uh combos and water slides i was wondering is it best that i like sell one of my combos and try to get a wet dry combo or water slide i would say no i mean does it right rest? you have i would say no too if it if it rents then you know it rents it's, it's space is another thing too though i mean i guess if you don't have space then you might have to but yeah i mean like when i started my inventory sucked as far as diversity and what right because i didn't know what i was doing i was just buying random stuff and then um as as the business starts to grow right because it's if you do a decent job you're gonna grow and you're gonna start to have a cash flow and you're gonna start to figure out what you actually need. Like I figured out the combo thing pretty fast where I was like, okay, check, right? Went through winter, all the water slides just sit, were sitting in my shed at the time. And I knew what to buy because I kind of had experience. Now my inventory is on point because I know what to do. You won't know exactly what you need until you start renting, but just start renting and making money. And then your clients will talk to you and you'll know what does better and yeah. It's, you know, it comes down to also, what is it that people search for? So I see a lot of people that they say, you know, I want to kind of like, uh, I think Gennaro mentioned, if you're trying to, like some people go in, like, I want to do something unique, uh, like the wedding bounce house or, or, or like this or that or soft play. A lot of those people reach out to me for marketing help and they're struggling. And, and frankly, it's, it's difficult to help those people because, you know, there's not that many people searching for soft play or a white wedding bounce house when compared to bounce house rentals. I mean, when we look at the Google, uh, Google ads data, there's almost a 200% increase in 2022 when compared to 2021 of people searching for bounce houses. This industry is growing. There's more people The demand for bounce house rentals is growing. So that's where you should be at least starting out for you to start out and say, you know, I'm going to stand out for my competition. So I'm going to, I'm going to rent out, you know, really fancy table covers. That's fine. But you're gonna, it's really gonna be very hard to find that niche audience. And uh, if your goal is to do something on the side, that's something that you love, that's one thing, but 
if your goal is to make it up income to where your business can support itself and support your family, then you want to go to after those high, high volume cert, uh, uh, sought after items, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Steve, Steve Pruitt, I think you got your hand up. Yeah, sorry. I was going to add in to what uh, I think Gino was saying a minute ago as far as like the niches. Um, it doesn't, if you're like trying to test the waters instead of trying to go full fledged, like into just toddler stuff, if you're really just trying to figure out if you want to be in the business or not. Those crossovers that was uh, brought up a minute ago, you know, the, the top of it, like I said, you don't see the, um, they don't really have like the, like uh, the plastic covering on the vinyl and stuff. Um, so like the stains might catch a little harder or you'll have to keep up cleaning them a little more, but those things will last. And um, you can put that kind of stuff more in SUVs and stuff like that as well. I've got one of the wet dry um, combos um, and then just a regular uh, bounce house and their 12 foot slide from tent and table. And I mean, they're just as big and just as good as quality as the other ones. They're just probably not going to last three or four years. You know what I mean? Um, so there was, there's that to take from that. Um, but, you know, that, that might help you. And sorry, I'm not talking as much. I'm actually. I see. Well, thanks for participating. Appreciate you. And, and someone is asking in the chat if it's possible to make a thousand dollars a week your first year. Honestly, uh, it's it's a few different things. You need you know you need a handful of things, but you know okay. So there's a lot of different things you could do. You could market on Google. You could you could change up your website. But the one thing you can't easily do, honestly, is inventory. If you've spent ten grand on items, it's really hard. Like Lakeisha was just saying, do I sell that stuff to get it? So get if you get the right stuff, you can always try to find the right person to help you market it. Help the, the, to find the right website to help you get it on there find the best pictures to get your stuff on there. But the biggest expense, I guess the two biggest expenses in this industry are the inventory in the truck. So those are gonna be the hardest things to replace if you do those wrong. So in my opinion, you gotta get those right. Don't, don't get the flashy stuff, get, get this, this multicolored combos that are wet dry. Don't get the fancy, you know, a, a Toy Story bounce house that sure, everybody loves Toy Story, but they gotta have a Toy Story party, right? And what if they don't make another movie or, or, or Frozen? So get the multicolored, gender neutral, wet dry combo with slides so that it can be, you're not gonna have the most unique equipment out there, but that's what there's demand for. And then, and, and that, that should really set you up. There's so much work out there, guys. So much work out there, depending where you're at. So just having the right stuff is, is a big, big step. So I, I botched that. I'd be, wait, I wouldn't be talking to you guys, right? I'd be in the Bahamas somewhere if I was, if I had done, <laughs> yeah, we would have we done much better but that's that's kind of my my final thoughts on that another thing you brought up a good point about vehicles is that the ownership of the vehicles makes a big difference on your insurance um so if you guys are just doing a dba you know you guys are just doing it as a sole proprietorship it, you have a little bit more flexibility, but if you guys are like an LLC or an S corp and you do not own vehicles in the company name, you, you absolutely at a very, very least, you want to make sure you have hired and not owned auto coverage uh, for those vehicles. If they're still owned in your personal name, uh, just in case you were to get to an accident. Um, another thing too, is to, if, if for whatever reason you think that you're covered under your personal auto insurance for this commercial use, I would make sure that you get it in writing from your agent. If you guys are using a local agent, uh, there's a big distinction between getting a personal auto policy endorsed for business use versus a commercial auto policy. Uh, a business use endorsement that in, it basically implies that you're doing basic business errands, right? You're going to the bank, you're going to the post office. Uh, you may have to go to the Costco to pick up some Gatorade for your crew. That's something that's business use. But commercial use by definition is the pickup and delivery of equipment. So if you guys do not have a commercial auto policy, you may not be covered if you get to a car accident. So that's something to consider. I think everybody thinks about the bounce houses flying away in the wind um, as being the major thing that keeps them awake at night. But in my world, I think it's way more likely that you'll get into a car accident on your weekend trips as you guys are you know, trying to build your business. Um, you might have some very young people that are driving for you. Uh, that can absolutely wreck your insurance. So just wanted to keep that in mind. 
Um, if you guys are, are looking into buying vehicles or if you plan to have your personal vehicles as your business uh, fleet, essentially, just to get started, uh, a lot of people will start out with hired non-owned auto just because they're using the personal vehicles or if they're renting a box truck or something from Penske. Uh, that's something that's also covered under that policy. Um, but just keep that in mind. It, it's, it's not just like, oh, I have auto insurance, so I'm covered. There, there's fine print in there. I want to make sure you guys are aware of that. <clears throat> So, so let's talk about vehicles. Um, starting up, right? I was never a truck guy. I had a sedan. I, I used to get out of the hospital. I used to get off work at 6 a.m., working a night shift. I had my, my old Infinity sedan, shove the bounce house in the back seat, and go deliver my scrubs, right? Uh, until we, we got bigger stuff. I started with toddler units for, for that reason. I needed something that could fit in the car, and I wasn't going to go spend you know all that money on a truck. And now they're even more expensive. Uh, but what we did do for a long time was we just we would just rent every weekend. We would rent from we started from U-Haul and then we got a, a good deal with Penske. And um, eventually uh, last year we ran into some trouble because uh, there was so much demand on rentals. One weekend I called and I said, hey, I want to rent one for this weekend. They're like, we're out. I'm like, what do you mean we're out? We're, I'm screwed. I got like 20 things I got to deliver. So uh, they, they do offer a long term lease. So what we did is we leased two trucks from May all the way through uh, September. And uh, we paid, we took their insurance, which uh, Alex will tell you from what I, I mean, that's the best thing to do is go with their insurance. Don't, don't get your own, they have. Uh, and we did use their insurance once, but uh, it's expensive if you have like five items, but if you have bigger inventory, then it's worth it. But that's, uh, that's been my experience with, uh, with, I've delivered from a sedan to minivans, to, to cargo vans, to truck and trailer. Never bought a box truck, never, never had the courage to go all out, but I will rent. So uh, I know there's a, big, uh, there's a big debate out there. What's better, pick up truck and trailer or box truck or van, cargo van? So I'll turn around to you guys uh, from, I guess we could hear from a starter perspective, where to start if you don't already have a truck. And then, can, I, uh, can I say I, something real quick? Go ahead, Sean. <clears throat> so I just want to uh, say a big shout out to Tariq and Nick. Uh, my website went up on... March 26th and I followed all their guides and all their videos religiously and I'm at three grand right now for my first month so I should hit hopefully four grand by the end of the month so if you follow what they say to the T uh, you'll do well I only have five units wow, man. Right. wow that's awesome man congrats congrats thank you man really really glad to hear it. that's that's why we do this man that makes my day <laughs> and Tariq, you mentioned something about the insurance that you can get from the rental place. If you have higher non-owned auto coverage, you don't need to buy the liability coverage. The thing about higher non-owned autos is it does not cover the damage to the non-owned vehicle. So buy the damage waiver from Penske, but you wouldn't need to buy the liability coverage. Okay. If you, if you have higher non-owned auto, that's what I'm just throwing out there. We looked, uh, so the benefit of having the insurance through them for me, was one day we had this big 19 foot slide soaking wet. It was by itself in the, in, the, in the Penske truck and these guys floored it and it rolls back and hits the door and they couldn't get the door open anymore. And we had to basically break the door open to get our unit out. And I called Penske and I had in a, a brand new truck the next day. So uh, just use their insurance. I felt bad, but uh, that's, that's the benefit. If, I, if that was my box truck, I would have been without a truck for weeks, right? And all that money I would have missed out on. So to me, for me, I'm not a, I'm not a hands-on guy. I'm, my biggest fear was also like repairs. Like where do I even take a box truck to repair it? How long is it going to sit in the truck? So we're not there yet, but I'll turn it around to you guys. Nick, what, how, how, what are you delivering? Uh, I think you, I see in your videos, truck and trailer. trailer. Yeah, I'm trailer. That stuff to start out, like when you started, you had 10 grand. What do you spend your 10 grand on? You spend it on truck, trailer, inventory. How do you, how do you do all that? Yeah, so we went we went heavy on inventory until we um, kind of got to the spot where uh, we had too big of a unit to really fit in the Armada or just, it wasn't realistic. So at that point, I went on Marketplace and found some goofy little trailer. It was a tilt trailer for a motorcycle. I built wooden walls on it. It was kind of a mess, but it was a trailer. I got it, you know, for 400 bucks. So, um, and then from that point, um, once we then scaled, I bought out a, a, a company, a bunch of old crappy bounce houses nine nine at one time and at that point i was like i have to have a gate so then i went and bought 
you know, a little rinky dink one from Lowe's. And from that point, you know, forward, I just love the versatility of the trailer. So now that I've scaled the company even bigger, so I have two trucks and two trailers, but we had to run three on Easter. I can either stick one of my trailers on one of my guy's trucks or one of my guys has his own truck and trailer and it just, it just goes, it's just totally, you know, interchangeable for the box truck. I see the advantage to them. I like the rolling billboard of bounce houses and water sides going down the highway on my trailer with the signs on. So, um, I'm a huge fan of the utility trailer. I have no intentions of switching from it, but I do like to change my mind from time to time. So that could always change, but, um, truck and trailer, what I would do if I was new. So when I was brand new, um, right after the Armada, um, I had enough cash to go buy a little Jeep Cherokee. So I bought a little Jeep Cherokee it was a V6 because I knew it could pull a trailer and then my little rinky dink trailer. And I rocked what that way, way too long, but then, you know, and just kept saving the money and then used the jump off money, you know, to then upgrade things as I went. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of small SUV because it's cheaper and small little trailer. And then you can scale from there. Where I'm at now, we have a truck and trailer and we have the Penske that we lease. I got a bunch of high schoolers working for me now and that's where I'm stuck. They're, I don't trust them with the truck and trailer. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I guess the license, you don't need a special license for it, at least out here, but they can't reverse. Like I start to try to teach them how to reverse and like, you know what, I'm just gonna hop in with you. I'll just, I'm stuck the whole day delivering. So I'm like, you know what, I would rather, that, that's been my struggle, truck and trailer, it's really versatile, like you said, rolling billboard, great. Um, you could use the truck by itself, you could use truck and trailer, but that's kind of where I'm stuck at my, now that I have employees and they're younger and um, yeah. And we did have one time uh, 11 chairs fly off the trailer on the highway and almost totaled one car. So uh, we had- That's my nightmare. That. That's, yeah. that's, I'm, maybe I'm too trusting, I don't know. I, and I, I'm thorough when I teach them, you know, how to drive, how to back the trailer in. Um, a lot of times, yeah, yeah, I'm, I like to teach. So I guess it's, I don't know, not an issue that part, but I'm, I'm strict on them when they load the trailer and it's kind of wonky. I will make them redo it because I'm, that's what I said. You know, I'm like, you're going to roll a three, $4,000 unit off onto the interstate. I'm like that in itself is an expense. I said, but what about the, Camry that's behind you that's going to rear end a four thousand dollar unit. What what about their car? What about their light? Like no 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 no. So um, and if you watch my YouTube videos on loading a trailer, you'll see how I do it. It's very unique. It's I've never seen anybody do it you know like that. Um, but if you do it properly, there's not going to be as many issues. That that is also not covered by your general liability insurance. Just going to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> right that's why i'm so scared so <laughs> right steve what are your thoughts on uh on trucks trailers vans when i started um you know i started off with uh no vehicles i, I focus on just going heavy on inventory so if i had ten thousand dollars i would go heavy on inventory um, get a contract through U-Haul or Penske for a uh, rental of uh, some cargo vans or some box trucks. And that's what I did for about a year. I was just renting uh, every weekend. And as soon as I started getting some money and some, and, and some equity, I, I went out and I bought a couple of uh, cargo vans. Um, once I had some money, I went out and I, I, I financed a cargo van. And, you know, when I would go um, out to do the errands, it was that single guy in a cargo van going to the post office and using it for personal use. But on weekends, it was busy. It was busy and loaded with bounce houses. How'd you start up, Brian? Uh, I started with like a 95 Toyota Tacoma. Well, you know, that's, I didn't have enough for a trailer. So I just, you know, stacked that little truck up. Good old 22R engines never gave up on me. And, you know, within, I think it took about three years for me to save up. I like the enclosed trailers. Those are over that I got used to those. And then, you know, upgraded the truck to like, a, I think a Nissan Titan at the time. And 
got the bigger trailer and, you know, kind of taught myself how to reverse. It took me a while. But, you know, patient is key in the game, you know, and, you know, you got to keep hustling no matter how you start. I actually still have that Tacoma. So, I have it. <laughs> so yeah, you know, just keep working hard and then, you know, have your, you know, eyes set of that goal you want. You want that big trailer, you got to work for it unless you're rich. But then you wouldn't be in the inflatable industry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a you guys are jogging my memory here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. How do, you ensure, how do you ensure that the um, person that's renting has enough space and room for your rental? Like my, I have mine on my my website. It has the dimensions, and then I don't want to say it's an honor system, but it's just kind of you know, it says we need this much room. And Nick, do you actually have the just the dimensions of the unit, or do you have like the dimensions of the unit plus like an, a foot or two, basically, so that way there's a little bit more leeway, so they're not like, oh yeah, it'll fit. <laughs> um, right. I've so, seen other pictures of people like they can't get it through the gate. You know, the, the backyard is fine, but they just the the unit itself is just too big <laughs> to get it through. Yeah. So I have both. So it says uh, dimensions of the unit, and then dimensions needed to set up. Yeah. And so then um, I kind of you know expand it because the if it's going to be 13 feet wide, you're going to have the stair and then the kids are going to have to be able to get in. And then you got a blower on the other side. So 13 feet, you know, doesn't cut it. Um, and then I'm just kind of the area that we're in, in Louisiana, just, we have big yards and we have big gates. So I don't have a ton of issues that you would see in, in, um, a, a lot of them I see in, or, or people ask me if from California and they rent out bounce houses more than anything because everything's so, gates and yards are so small that you can't fit other stuff. I don't have those issues. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we put my 60 foot obstacle course in the backyard every freaking weekend. So. To add a little bit more to that question, um, that, that's a great question to ask during the reservation process. Um, when you're talking to that customer, uh, when in doubt, uh, it's, it's great for you to uh, see if they can send you a picture. I know the picture is not going to give you dimensions and size, um, but it will give you an idea. And, and if it calls for the husband or, or someone to go out and measure the yard, then that's what's going to have to be needed. Um, at times, there have been uh, instances where we have sent team members to go out and do a measurement of the yard just so that the customer can make an informed decision. So if that's something that's near your business and it's going to be worth and increase the probability of sale, that might be something to consider. Uh, not all the time, but sometimes. You can use Google Earth oh, just, too. There's a, there's a measure feature on Google Earth to where if you think it's going to be an issue, you can just click the ruler and literally measure it as long as they don't have gigantic trees. I did it the other day. Yeah, I was just thinking the auditor website has dimensions too. All right, so let's talk about uh, storage. Where's everybody storing their stuff? Um, garage, some people have uh, storage units, warehouse. Maybe you store them in the truck, right? If you have a, a trailer or a, or, or a cargo van, you use that as storage. Uh, we started in, uh, I was living in a condo at the time. We started in a garage and then we moved to a storage unit, then another storage unit, and then we had eight storage units. And it's like, man, what point do we make the jump and get a warehouse? Warehouse was twice the amount of rent than the storage units were. But, um, you know, at some point it was, it made sense for us to jump over there. So Nick, how did you start out? Where are you at now? Still, I think you mentioned your storage. Yeah. I'm unfortunately still at storage. I have three. Um, and it's just a, it's a real estate problem. I can't find a warehouse that's Anywhere near where I am, the closest one is like 25 minutes away. And there's a bunch over there, but I don't want to be 25 minutes away. So I stay seven minutes away in the storage. Um, I have two units that are right next to each other that are 15 by 30. And so I kind of have to store everything standing up, um, but it works. You know, it, it works great. And like you said, it's it's about half the rent of, of what a warehouse would be. The That's the upside. The downside is, you got to clean them somewhere. So we still clean them at my house. And so right now it rained on um, Sunday night. And so it's kind of muddy in the yard. So I've got 13 left, I think, in the garage. 
Um, and then we're blowing them up on the driveway and the front yard. So all the guys will be able tomorrow to finish. Um, Trevor came and did four today. And then we have to trailer. So either I then have to trailer them back over to storage or I got to pay the guys to trailer them over to storage. And so it's kind of one of those things where you look at it and you say, okay, right now I'm paying 750 bucks a month for three storage units and two parking spots for a truck and trailer and trailer. Whereas it's going to be 15, 16, 700 bucks for a warehouse, but the amount of time, you know what I mean? And, and busy weekends like Easter, it's like, you, you think of all the logistics and then you get down to it's time to load the trailer at five in the morning on Easter morning. And you forgot one thing back at the house. It's, it's messy, but it gets us through until I can find, I'm on two waiting lists. So I'm waiting for a warehouse. That, that's a really good, I'm glad, glad you mentioned distance. Uh, our, my warehouse is about 15 minutes away. Any farther, I think I'd be miserable. You, you, you know how it is. On a Saturday, a blower is going to burn out. You're going to have to go stop in the middle of your barbecue with whatever you're doing with your kids. Go grab a blower. Go take it. Or so, somebody forgets a dolly. It sucks when it's far. If you can get something, that would be my number one recommendation for storage, where, whatever it is, wherever you put your stuff, close to home is the most important thing. More important than anything else. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're right to wait. It makes a huge difference. Any questions on, on storage, Casio, Alex, uh, Brian, Steve, you guys have anything to add on that? If you guys um, are storing, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. Mine will be long-winded, so go ahead. I was gonna say, if you're in a budget, just store it at your parents' house. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. That, that's a good segue for, for my addition here is that if you guys are going to be storing them in your house, just keep in mind that your homeowner's insurance does not cover that. That's business personal property, so that's not covered by your homeowner's insurance. So if you're concerned about your equipment being covered, get an inland marine policy. Um, the distinction between inland marine and property coverage is that property usually only covers that equipment within 100 feet of that location. Inland marine covers it no matter where it is. So it's in the storage facility, at your parents' house. Um, it doesn't matter where it is. Uh, it could be in transit, could be set up at the event. It doesn't matter. That's that's the, ben the benefit and the beauty of Inland Marine. The, the downside is, though, is if you guys were to build your warehouse, you know, you guys own the building, you can't cover the structure under an Inland Marine policy. So you would need to have both a property policy and an Inland Marine policy. So just when you guys get to that point, just keep your insurance guy in the loop. Hopefully they'll be able to guide you through that that transition. Alex, why you got to make everything scary, man? He just said, I don't want to my parents' house. He just sound real That's scary. What he does every time he shows up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Now I, I got to quit. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's important stuff. Well, that's that's why you're here. Because otherwise, I'm like, yeah, it's fine. But, uh, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, what? what? How many things am I doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> right? I, mean, never I have thought another that. question. About generators, do you have a generator for uh, every unit? No, I have zero generators actually. To be honest with you, I, I have one personal one because I live in South Louisiana, so I have one that runs the house uh, when storm when hurricanes come through. Uh, but I've never rented it out. It's not for rent on my website. I I don't even mess with them. I bought I bought generators when we started because all my competitors had generators. But yeah. Uh, it's something you only need if it's at a park and you don't want to do park events anyways, honestly, they're annoying. Um, uh, but yeah, you only, if you are going to have a generator, you only need one per event and depending, are, are you going to need one? Are you going to have one park every single weekend? Uh, you're not going to need, you know, one for every unit to answer your question. So I have a question. And you can always rent them if, if you do have a big event where you need them. Sorry, go ahead. Um, if we're storing our equipment in an enclosed trailer, what should we be doing insurance wise to cover us until we can get like a storage unit or a small warehouse or something? So from a, uh, just from the policy standpoint, I'll, I'll tackle it two different ways, I guess. From the policy standpoint, you want to have the inland marine coverage. Um, with our programs, they don't like covering the trailers because those get stolen pretty easily. Um, so I would say just in general, like in general business insurance world, you can cover a trailer under an inland marine policy. But what we mm -hmm. recommend you do is that we cover the contents of the trailer 
under an inland marine policy, but the trailer itself covered that under the commercial auto or your personal auto policy. In any case, you want to make sure that your trailers are on your auto policy, whether it's a personal or a commercial one, um, because the liability follows the vehicle that's pulling it. But if it's not on the on the policy and you hit somebody with your trailer, they might not cover it. Okay. Thank um, you. Other thing from just like a security standpoint, just make sure that you can fence it in or at the very least you have a hitch lock and a wheel lock, ideally um, double up as much as you can to slow down the, uh, the theft. Uh, because again, mm -hmm. most people, if they just have them in their backyard, somebody cuts the chain link fence, they drive off with your trailer with all your equipment in it. Um, yeah, that's so my fear. <laughs> exactly. So the other thing too, is that if you have an inland marine policy, you also have a business income limit. So you, that lost income or the potential lost profit that you have from renting out that equipment, not only do you have to replace the equipment, but you also can't rent anything out. So it's another reason to have inland marine coverage. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so let's pause here and, and see, does anybody want to talk about anything specific? I, again, I got a bunch of points I can go over. Um, we're kind of getting deep and deep, so. Uh, I'll have a question. Any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Can you, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I live in the country. My, my, my connection's terrible out here. Um, my, one of my questions is when renting out these slides, I mean, it, it, from what everybody's saying, all the YouTube videos, what you guys are saying, um, the, the, the dry and wet slides seem like the way to go. How are you guys cleaning these up? Are you rolling them up all wet? Um, what's, what's like your cleanup, your cleanup routine post party? Yeah, so we're, we're um, okay, I'll, I'm actually answer two ways. So if it's a wet dry combo, you can clean those on site when you're a small company. When you start to get big, it gets to be a pain because you have a lot to do and you got to jump inside and vacuum them out. So those, we roll those soaking wet and they come back. My garage is literally dripping into the freaking driveway right now. I'm not even joking. Um, and then we re-blow them up, clean them thoroughly, roll them dry, and then trailer them back over to storage. With the tall water slides, you know, like a, just a regular water slide, um, I would say 85 to 90% of the time, we just towel them off at the customer's house because, you know, we do six hour rentals. And so we can just blow them up or they're sorry, they're already blown up. So we can just towel them off. And then um, we have spray bottles with the little disinfecting spray that I use. And we clean you know, up the stairs, the landing, down the slide, inside the pool to make sure that's disinfected, towel off the outside, roll it. It goes straight back to storage. We don't mess with it again. that answer your question yeah i'm so sorry like i said i i, I live out in the country and uh it, it totally kicks me out of zoom for like your first whole half of the answer <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry yeah. for everyone on no, here you're good you're good so uh wet dry combos yeah roll them wet take them back to the house and then re-blow them back up to dry them off vacuum them out get them clean beautiful thank you so much yeah, well, can I ask a little bit on that? So you're basically, hello, uh, you're basically saying don't like go all out and just re-wet them over again. Try to do as little extra wetting as you can. And like you said, dry them off and then wipe them down. Is that yeah, what you're so, pretty much saying? Yeah. So when we, when I started, right, we would roll everything. Uh, we rolled everything soaking wet, but we'd roll everything, come back to the house, roll it back up and clean it. And then after a long enough period of time, I realized we're not even really doing anything with the big water slides. Let's just towel those off and make sure that we get the, the part that the kids are going to be on all disinfected. Um, and then we can just wipe that off the freaking to-do list. If we would, if we were doing, so we had 17 to clean today, starting today, I think 17 or 18. If we had the tall water slides to clean too, we would have had like, oh my God, I think we would have had 28, you know, it takes that whole workload out of the cleaning because it's kind of redundant anyway. That's one less you got to blow up, one less you got to, you're going to re-roll your 21 foot slide after you just wipe water off of it. It's brutal. So that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What about, what about overnight rentals? I don't know how Alex feels about that, but, um, does anybody leave them, you know, like for us, we, if it's wet, 
we just leave it overnight. We pick it up the next morning. We have them turn it on and um, we just don't want, you know, and then uh, when we pick ours up and to, to answer your question about cleaning procedures, when we pick up the unit, uh, we have a, a, a system where uh, they put a tag on it. We just have caution tape. Yellow caution tape means dirty. Red caution tape means damaged. Green tip caution tape means clean. So if it's clean, that just means it's generally clean. It's not disinfected. So we pick it up uh, from the, when we pick it up from the customer, we grade it. Uh, if, if it's not disgusting, if it's not wet, then we just mark it green. Green is clean. And then the next time we take it to the customer's house, we don't even open it up because it's dry. It's generally clean. Might be some grass in there or something. We open it up at the customer's house. We vacuum it. We sanitize it. We're good to go. We don't have to unroll it. If it's wet, we, we, uh, we, have blue, we do have blue for wet as well. Uh, if it's wet or dirty, then we do have to open it up at the warehouse and, uh, and dry it. But generally speaking, we, uh, we'll call. We have an overnight fee. I think it's like $75. Um, but if it's a wet unit, we will uh, throw in free overnight. So we'll tell them you get to keep it overnight for free uh, and we'll just pick it up the next morning. Me personally, we don't have a lot of rentals on Sundays. I know a lot of people want to pick it up on, on uh, you know, Saturday so they can rent it again on Sunday. It just doesn't happen often for us. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, but even when it does, um, you know, we ask them, you know, we appreciate it. I have a really nice text message that I send out using a vet hawk and I'm like, you know, you'd be saving our, our uh, you know, we have teenagers that work for us or high school kids or college kids, whatever. I forgot how I worded, but you'd be saving their backs if you, you know, inflated it in the morning so that it wasn't too heavy. And surprisingly that works. People like personal. They don't like the formal texts. You know, you must turn on the inflatable. No, right. they, they, they like when it's personal and, and we get there and usually it's, it's pretty dry. Uh, so that's, that's what's worked for us. But for that, uh, like what you were saying, leaving it overnight, uh, for me, we don't try to do that because that we're worried about uh, the rowdy people that get drunk. You starting to use it after a certain time of night on a Saturday. So that's kind of like why we would rather pick it up than leave it over overnight rather than that. But I'm sure you're a lot bigger. So I, I would rather pick it up too. But when you got 50 going out over a weekend and yeah. for, for us as well, it, it makes it harder for um, – our, our, our guys, you know, you'd be surprised how many perfectly healthy football players get stomach aches on Saturday nights. And like, oh, I have a stomach ache. I can't go to work. I was like, oh my God, you're the third guy today. What's in there? So uh, uh, a big selling point for us recently was only day shift. You don't work evenings. You get to, you get to hang out with your friends on Saturday nights. We just pick up most everything the next day. Uh, we have our OG crew. They do, you know, overnights. I can trust them. That's another big, big thing that we get a lot of call offs at night and then I have to end up leaving my family to go do it. And I just don't want that anymore. So uh, that's, that's, that helps us with that as well. Just to add that on from the insurance perspective, it's probably less risky for an overnight rental versus a customer pickup. So from our perspective, at least all the carriers that we work with, they don't have an issue with overnight rentals. It's just that they want you to have a section within your rental agreement that your renter has to sign off on or initial saying that they're going to remove the blower from the unit and keep it in their house or in the garage for that exact same reason, Fred, because they don't want it to be an attractive nuisance um, and somebody who's not supposed to be on the unit that just walks by and they turn it on and they start using it. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the only way that you can really restrict the use when it's not supposed to be used. But um, from an insurance perspective, they don't charge you any more for that. They don't see that as being super high risky. They just want to make sure that your renters know what they're supposed to do. Sorry, if you have your hand up, you can just uh, unmute. Uh, I had a, a question. So um, in terms of like, um, let's say whenever you're starting out, you might have like family help you out. Uh, at any point, would you like bring them on as like a 1099 contractor, just so you can uh, write off, you know, what, what the business expenses of, of, you know, like the labor that you're paying them or, or, and then kind of like, once you kind of get bigger, do you recommend just hiring like 1099 contractors for, for your business or, or well, what did you guys do for yours? Um, I, I'll feel this. I'm not a lawyer, so this is not um, lawful sound advice, but I'm going to tell you what I do, and I'm going to be 100% honest with you. 
So as of right now, um, I still have all my guys on 1099, but we're switching to W2 this year. Um, just waiting. My CPA is just mega backed up and it's kind of a little bit of a headache. Um, I used to pay, this is a long time ago, but I used to pay under the table because I was ignorant. I didn't know, right? I thought it was easier for everybody. And then I get, then I hired the CPA, right? Because then I had two businesses and I'd never done business taxes before, right? So we get to the CPA and she asked me how much I paid, blah, 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 blah. And I told her under the table and she like, she freaked out. She got mad at me because she's like, you're paying all this money that there's no way, right? So I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I, it's my advice I give everybody is if you're teeny tiny, just 1099 them because um, I don't, I don't remember the whole reasons here that Amy used to tell me, but 1099 them because it keeps them in your business. And then yes, you can claim that, that money. Once you start to get to scale, it's the right thing to do both by law and you know, morals, I guess you could say, to turn to W2. So that is why I'm working on that now. It's just the process has been much slower than I'd hoped for. Yeah, I started, I started as a, a 1099 initially uh, and a couple of years, two or three years after we switched to W2 um, and, and W2 has been the way we, we, we've kept everyone. Um, and, and, uh, I'll, I'll throw in my two cents on that from an insurance standpoint, it makes a huge difference what you guys do with 1099 or W2 employees. Um, you know, especially when it comes to workers' compensation, uh, there's, I just want to also throw this out there. There's no such thing as a 1099 employee. You're either a subcontractor, or you're an employee. There's no in between. So um, just keep that in mind. You know, it, there's like a litmus test that they do to see if they are in fact an employee or if, you know, if they're a 1099, just in name. Um, usually if it comes to court, I would argue that most of the time they're going to say that they're an employee, not a 1099 because they don't have their own insurance. They, they don't set their own schedule. They don't have all that autonomy that a true subcontractor would. So just be very, very careful with that. Um, you know, I, I know just the taxes and all that other stuff, that's usually why people want to put them on 1099. But um, I don't know. You know, I, I think that it might be almost shooting yourself in the foot to do it that way. But, you know, I'm the insurance guy. So I, I have a different perspective of, of just like how things should be structured. But I understand like you guys may have volunteers even like they're not even a contract. They're just your, your kids or your nephew or something that's helping you out. Um, if they were to get injured, that is something that's covered under an accident policy, for example. Um, it's not it's nowhere near as robust as a workers' compensation policy. But if a volunteer or one of these 1099 people gets injured, they're not covered under a workers' comp policy. So you need to have some sort of a benefit in place for them should they get injured. Um, at least to help them with their out-of-pocket medical bills. It's the same exact policy that you have for your participants or your renters. It's the same type of coverage. It's just a rider added to that policy. Yeah, the, the way it was worded to me um, by somebody who knows this, the laws, if you W2, I'm sorry, if you 1099, you're not doing it correctly. And if something happens and you get complained on to the state uh, commit work commission, they're going to win the case because you did it wrong because they are acting as an employee under 1099. Now you're such a small operation. Nobody's going to come after you unless you piss off one of the workers and they go report you. So you have to take care of your people. Right. But that being, so basically when I was told that is when I said, well, why the hell didn't you tell me that a long time ago? Let's please switch them all to W2. And then that's when the process kind of started. But, but if you want to do it properly, just W2 them from jump. It's just, it's harder to do and it's more expensive to do. The thing too is sometimes your insurance may not cover the work of subcontractors. Uh, just want to throw that out there too. It'll cover employees, no problem. Owners and employees usually automatically covered under your general liability coverage, but you start throwing in subcontractors, read the fine print. Hey, if I was to start, I asked about the, um, if I have one bounce house, I have a way to tow it and get it to places and stuff. It's a used bounce house. If I were to start 
renting that out or had the idea of a business like down the road. I'm a teacher. I have like the summer off and I'm, I'm in New York. There's nothing around me other than like I'm an hour plus away from Rochester. So there's nothing around me that does bounce houses. So how would I start and what would be like the plan of attack to eventually become a business? Like if you had to go in order of do this, this, then this, I get, I get that. But where do you go? Where do you start? What do you start with? Uh, what I did, Alex would get real mad at me. Um, but I, I put that sucker on marketplace, bro. I had to put, put it on marketplace and we started dropping it off. It's not, it's not what I suggest anybody else do, but I am always open and I'm always honest. And so that's what I did. Um, and then once I started looking into everything, that's when I was like, oh, shit, I got to get insurance. I got to right. And um, full disclosure, I, I didn't think this was an in, like, I didn't think this was, I didn't think I could do what I do now. I thought this was like a little goofy side hustle thing because I knew nothing about it. As it grew quickly, I realized, oh, this is actually a real business. And that's what my dream has always been to be an entrepreneur. Then I start looking at everything. Then, you know, from there, I got legitimate. But, and, and by the way, the hand tattoo just go doesn't mean be haphazard. It means don't overthink it. I mean, you got Alex Cosio right here and he already put in his phone number. So go get a quote. Uh, about that, I'm kind of like on that level as well. <laughs> to like, oh no. But then now it seems like, I guess recently the prices have gone up for insurance and I've gotten some quotes that are like literally going to be like 30% of my yearly <laughs> estimate. And since I've just started, I don't know technically what our income is going to be, even if I estimated high because you estimate high because you get paid or you pay for either way. If you pay less, you, you, you have to pay the difference or if you, you estimate less. So make sure you're just looking for like a million dollar uh, quote. So, like what happened to me is like I was quoted for like $10 million or something like that. So just make sure they're not over quoting you. 10 million. Yeah, maybe it was like <laughs> well, 2 million. I don't remember what it was. Uh, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, so oh what's the minimum you all would recommend also? Yeah. I was uh, quoting, uh, getting quoted on 2 million with two events of uh, 1 million. So the, the standard should be, I'd say the standard, this is what most places will accept, is a million per occurrence with a two million aggregate. So all that means is that if you have one occurrence, one claim, the most that your policy will cover you for is a million dollars. But for the total amount of the policy term, they'll pay $2 million. So you could potentially be like the worst operator of all time, and you have two $1 million claims in one policy, you would still be covered and not have to worry about paying anything out of your pocket. Yeah, that's what I got. And they're like twenty six hundred dollars. That's that's, that's about right. Yeah. I mean yeah. you're the minimum premiums, just to give you context, five, ten years ago, the minimum premium used to be five thousand, ten thousand dollars. So it's been historically low. It's starting to go back up. So just be prepared for that. Like you guys may not have any claims. You may be at the minimum premium. You like why the hell is my insurance going up? It's just because the, the market's hardening. Uh, there's fewer and fewer insurance companies out there that want to write bounce houses because they see the videos of the, the bounce houses flying away. Um, but those are like the worst case scenarios. The ones that really just bleed them out is the real small, like, oh, I broke my arm. You know, I got, a, I got an attorney. Now we're suing you for $100,000. Like those are the ones that really just bleed an insurance company, just the frequent little small claims like that. Um, so I would say, I mean, everybody focuses on the general liability, right? That's what you need to operate. That's where you need the certificate of insurance. But again, I always go back to the accident policy. Like you really want to lean on that. Ideally, just get the get to pay for the medical bills only. You don't want to have an attorney involved at all because that's when they really start running the the amount of the claim up. I think the average accident claim we've seen is like twenty five hundred dollars, but the average liability claim is like fifty to seventy thousand dollars. It's a huge difference. It's if you're worried about it insurance for your bounce house business just think about it just like you're driving your car can you drive your car without insurance sure just don't get into a car crash well there's a lot of things that go on on the road that you don't control 
So should you get car insurance? Car insurance is expensive too. Yeah, you should get car insurance. It's the same with operating a business. Just bite the bullet, get the insurance, okay? What it's going to do is make you jump in. You're now jumped in. You've got to succeed because you just spent the money. So don't think about it as a negative. Think about it as a positive. If you're serious about building this business, spend the money on the insurance so you can operate properly, be protected, and then you can go after it. I, I will I will add something there. I think this is a great question. And um, what I will say is think about the end. What are your goals? Why are you getting into the business? And I can tell you that if you do things the right way and start off right with insurance, with training, with quality, with cleanliness, with customer service, you're going to capture more business and you're going to separate yourself from the competition. And Nick made a good point about the auto insurance. Like don't, don't buy the lowest possible limits for your business. Uh, you know, I understand everybody wants to keep the cost low, but just pay attention to the policies that you guys are buying. You know, if you, if you have a huge deductible, but you got a great deal on it, it it's not going to really help you out very much. If you, if you have to pay this huge deductible, if there's a claim, um, also pay attention to sublimits. I've seen that happen too, where like people are like, I have a million dollar policy, but they have a $50,000 bodily injury sublimit. So really you only have a $50,000 policy. So just keep that in mind. Um, a lot of times the, the devil is in the details with insurance. So ask the questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions and don't just rubber stamp it like, oh, okay, I've got my insurance quote. We're good to go. Um, you really need to be educated as much as you possibly can when you're starting out so that way you know what to look for. Um, you know, even people that have been doing this for a long time, they'll give you bad advice on insurance. I'm like, please don't say that. <laughs> please don't do that. Um, so just ask somebody who's licensed. It doesn't have to be me. Uh, you know, ask any of the other insurance companies that are out there. They'll, they'll give you good advice. So are you saying the first step, like if you wanted to do it, would be talk to an insurance company? Like, do you need to, like, I see stuff all the time in this bounce house website and it's like, talk to a lawyer, like talk to a lawyer first. Like, where do you go? Like, do you need to have yourself as an LLC? Do you like, what do you do? Like talk to a lawyer? I For the contracts. I absolutely. So. Yeah. I, I did everything yeah. myself. Um, and then, for yeah, for contracts, uh, yes, lawyer, you know, but like I, LLC. I mean, maybe it's different in other states, but that it literally took like twenty minutes, forty minutes. It was like a hundred bucks, hundred five dollars, and then boom, I got the certificate on the wall. You know what I mean? And from there, I could then you know start to get insurance, and um, from there you could start to track expenses, so you can write them off. But but in my opinion, yeah, get. Your first thing you need to do right now is think of a business name and Tariq's advice at the beginning of the video was spot on, then LLC, then you can start to go down the, the um, insurance road. Yeah. And we can try to help you lower the number of billable hours from that attorney. We, we have samples that we can send you guys for like the, the contracts and the waivers. These are purely samples, <laughs> really good examples to use just to get yourself started. Um, it has a lot of just the basics. Um, but absolutely get finalized by an attorney. I could, I could, I don't even know how many times I've seen it happen where we, we provide a sample to somebody and they send it back and it still says like insert business name here <laughs> throughout it. You're like, this is not going to work for the insurance company guys. We got to make sure that it has your information on it. Um, we don't need the signed copy of the waiver. We just need to see the version that you're going to provide to your customers. So some advice that someone gave me in the beginning, because you're, you're going to want it to be like state specific, state specific as well. Reach out to a few of like the people that are in your uh, like state. Um, I mean, possibly ask about either using theirs or, you know, just seeing what a, a sample of it is. I've even heard somebody say one time I called, they called three people, three different companies in the state and said that they were looking for a rental for a school. They wanted to know what the contract looked like. Then they just took everything that they knew needed to be in the contract and made their own contract out of it. I mean, again, you might want to, once you put that together, throw it to a lawyer and ask them to look at it. But if you've already kind of put something together, at least, you know, you're, you're set, you've saved a lot of time with it. You know, I guess that would be some something to look forward to. But I mean, 
the insurance is really the way I bring it down to everybody. I mean, mine's six thousand dollars a year. I probably do that in within like one or two schools just with what they give me throughout a year. But I mean, if you think about like that's two big water slip slide rentals, like six months out of the year, you know, like, yes, it's a big number in the beginning, but try not to look at it like that. Break it down over 12 months. And then you actually see, okay, you know, uh, you know, the $2,600, I mean, you're not even talking $300 per month. So, I mean, that's, that's a, a rental. And because of you having that insurance, you're going to be opening more doors for yourself that is definitely going to cover that small amount of money that is going to be added to your, you know, business plan. Steve, you brought up a good point too. Just because your, your insurance is based on your sales, a lot of the smaller people starting out, you're going to be at the minimum premium. So that's just the floor that it starts at. So let's say your projected sales are $10,000, right? Your premium is going to be the exact same, whether you projected 10,000 or you projected 5,000, it's the exact same amount. But if you hit 20,000, you're probably still going to be paying the minimum premium. So there's there's going to be a threshold that you hit probably when you hit like 30 to 40,000, maybe 50,000, depending on the carrier. And then you'll see that the premium starts to increase. Um, so a lot of people were like, oh, I'm projecting 30,000. What is it if I, if I project 100? They're like, oh, that's really not that much different. You're like, yeah, it's just at the floor. And then it's an incremental change as it goes up. So just keep that in mind, too. It's, it's not just going to automatically double your premium because your sales doubled. I got a question. Right. If it, if Thanks, guys. Stuff. You guys hear me all right? Cool. Um, yeah, so I had a, uh, and I apologize if this is already on the uh, one of your questions, Tariq, but uh, I don't have too much time left. But, so I wanted to ask um, when you're starting off your business, like me, I'm only seven months in, um, do it part time. And I'm trying to differentiate myself from like, the, you know, hundred dollar bounce house rental guy. So, you know, I'm kind of setting like a, a premium for all my inflatables. I'm not the highest, but I'm right below probably the most expensive guy. You know, all my reviews are coming in five star, my customer service. I make sure that's on point. So, I mean, should I expect to grow a little bit more slowly and just be patient? I don't want to give in because I'm not getting as many sales. I don't want to cut myself short and start offering my services for, you know, 25% less just to get the business. So I, I just, I know everybody in here probably has a different mindset when it comes to that stuff. So, I mean, if I'm trying to stay as a premium rental company, should I hold firm on my prices and just kind of continually, you know, to grow slower or should I just cut my prices, make the money and go from there? If that makes any sense to anybody. I don't think there's a wrong answer. And keep in mind too, this is just, I, I got in my mindset of, of growing over time. I don't want to blow up by any means because I personally don't have the time to do it between my primary job. Um, I just want to know at one point, at what point do you say, hey, I'm missing out on a lot of business. I need to cut my prices versus discounting your services, you know, from the other guys. It, it depends on you. So, so that was my mindset from jump. I said, I don't want a single one in the garage over to the weekends because they don't make me any money in the garage. So let's just be right. And we went, we went crazy on the specials we were running and the, the amount of work I was doing for the, the money, but it was like, I was enjoying it. So who cares, dude, I was taking bounce houses for hundred bucks. Cause that's what I wanted to do. Um, the thing about it is that market, um, or, or at that time I was servicing a market that exists that I have now priced myself out of. And I don't have a single one of those clients anymore because now I am the most expensive around where I am. Um, and I, I kind of went slowly. I didn't, I didn't jack it up quick. I went slowly and went five, $10 increments on units, you know, up and up and up. And then I, um, now my prices have been pretty static, but the time window has shortened, you know, now I'm six hour rentals. Uh, you got to pay more for overnight. You got to pay for more for the next day. Uh, then I started doing delivery fees right? And I sh now I've shrunk that delivery fee and I've raised the delivery fee. So outside of my free circle, which is now only 12 miles is 425 a mile. Um, but I, I did it slowly to, to answer your, I don't think you have, I don't think there's a wrong answer. 
drop them all down cheap and go work your guts out. It's a, it's a great way to grow your business. Be patient and be premium. It's a great way to grow your business. It just comes down to whatever you want to do. Okay. Yeah, that makes, I appreciate that. Makes sense. Do you consider yourself more of like a weekend warrior or do you take stuff on during the week? Oh, I mean, right now, I mean, I had the time. Well, my primary job, I work on the weekend. So that's, what's making this real tough is I do my drop offs early in the morning, go to work. And then I pick them up in the evening. I would love to get weekday rentals. Like that's what I want, but it's just, I can't get them. <laughs> Everything I get is, is Saturdays. So, you know, I have four or five drop offs on a Saturday, you know, and then I, I still got my normal job to go to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, right now I would say everything I do is pretty much birthday rentals, but um, I would love to get weekday rentals. So one one thing, just to kind of get your name out, get shared a little bit more, there is people, and I mean, this is not for everybody. So this is kind of goes back to the same thing of like giving discounts, but a lot of people throughout the summer, they'll do like drop off Monday morning, pick up Tuesday evening drop off Tuesday morning, pick up Wednesday evening. But then like Thursday, that's over with because stuff goes out for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So you kind of do like a two for one special. Um, you may want to jack that up. You may not want to do, you know, a two for one, but you know, that could definitely bring in you in more weekday stuff. But it's, it's a go the another step, call up schools. Um, <clears throat> this again is going to be discounted. I do school discounts because who is booking right now for the school either is not going to be there next year or they're not going to be there the year after that. I've been doing all the schools in my area. And well, no, I won't say all in my County, i do all of them, but then going further out, I'm starting to take over more and more of them, but I'm getting them by doing a 10% off discount necessarily in the beginning. Then that this is who we always use. This is who we call. If a teacher in the school, a parent in the school, anybody starts asking, they they recommend us, and they're not they're not getting a discount. So like that's how I've won over a lot of schools and churches. I'd probably say I do about sixty five percent of the churches even in like my county and the surrounding like four counties, and that's how I've been able to build that build that business. But I look at those orders now, and like when I see them come in for. 700 to 1200 dollars or whatever i'm just like look that's what it's nice because there's not even a discount on there okay all right i got you yeah i appreciate it hey, man. hey steve uh just on that like with the churches and stuff are you just kind of cold approaching the schools and the churches and just kind of introducing yourself or you know as some of that also part of you know like trying to get your name out there maybe setting up an event for free just to get in the community and so i we've posted like when we would first do like the yard sale sites and, and around us or just promoting on facebook and stuff we would let them know that we did school and church discounts and then that way they would have to call us but i also do a lot of especially when it comes to the schools call and ask to either speak with the um the PE teacher, the principal, or whoever is in charge of their, you know, uh, you know, field days and uh, spring festivals and, and uh, fall festivals, kind of depending on the time of year. January every year I start calling and it's not to necessarily ask that, but just to say, hey, you know, we want to get you guys a, a certificate holder of our insurance and, you know, let you know a little bit about us, um, you know, uh, we and uh, do what we need to do to be set up as a vendor. A lot of schools that will depend on the area. I'm in North Georgia, but they want you to fill out like a W-9, like a because a, a, so, they're paying you um, so that they have a record of it. Well, they'll want you to fill out that form just to be on the uh, approved vendor list. You don't want to wait till they're looking for someone to do it. You want to get on that list before they're trying to find someone to do it. Be on there beforehand. Go to the school boards. Um, I went in with the school board a few times and just just to talk to them and say, hey, you know, we just want to get y'all to be a, a, you know, a certificate holder. It's it's like letting, hey, I, I'm insured. Let us give you authorization over our stuff, which, I mean, I guess, and Alex can probably speak more on that, but it's peace of mind for them when it really comes down to it. 
I know, and then that gives them like a direct contact, I guess, to the insurance company. But other than that, it means exactly what it would have meant before. If you did something wrong there, they're coming after you, you know what I mean? Or, or to whatever extent, depending on what it is or your your uh, waiver can hold up for it. But at the end of the day, it's just a peace of mind thing. And because you came at them that way, other than saying, hey, you need to rent from us, check all out all this cool stuff we got. It's, hey, we're, we're setting up stuff correctly and we're insured, you know, now check us out. <laughs> Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, man. If you guys are trying to set up anywhere in a public place, public entities are like the number one sued entity out there. So they won't even let you get on the premises unless you have insurance and you name them as an additional insured. Um, that that's something that a lot of places they they won't even let you through the door without it. So uh, what Steve is talking about, like going in with an insurance is like your your foot in the door. You know, that's that's always peace of mind. Um, I used to sell accident insurance to like camps and stuff like that. And a lot of the camp uh, program runners, they would say, Hey, we have this accident insurance. So God forbid your kid gets hurt. We have this accident policy in place. Or if your kid gets sick, you know, we could take care of it. You don't have to worry about anything out of pocket. So they really use that as a peace of mind to help get their foot in the door and, and just get the sale. So um, just having the insurance, I mean, it, it's required a lot of places, but just having it and just offering that up is like, hey, we we take this seriously. Safety is important to us. And if something does happen, go sideways, you're going to be covered for any of our negligence if that was to happen. And sorry, uh, just the last thing on that, that Alex, is as long as we have the signage out. So like here in Northern Ohio, we do a lot of uh, like festivals and all kinds of stuff. So as long as we have that signage out front, I think is that's what you were talking about earlier. Uh, because we're not going to have yep. every person that comes through sign a waiver. Right. Now, is it, is it, I guess my like question to you is though, is, you know, like if the, per, the folks are going to pay for the service for us to be there to kind of like monitor how many kids are coming in and out of the bounce house, is that a requirement? Cause you know, some people may say like, look, we don't want to pay for your services. We'll do it on our own. Is that, how does that work? You tell me required for you to staff the equipment? Yes. So this is almost counterintuitive. Uh, a lot of the schools will require that you you do staff the equipment, but in reality, if an injury occurs and you staff that unit, you know who's going to be responsible 100%. <laughs> so you're the one who's in control of that unit. They're going to they're going to absolutely hang that around your neck. Um, so it's weird. It, it almost doesn't make sense, but from an insurance perspective, it's better that you set it up show them how to run it and leave <laughs> because then whatever happens during that party, that's on them uh, supposed to be on them at least um, other than a negligent setup. That's really the only thing that they're going to really just nail you on. Uh, but as far as staffing the equipment, I've seen both schools of thought. Some people say I will not do a school event unless I staff it. So I know for sure that it's being run correctly. Other people say, Oh no, PTA you're responsible for it. We're going to show you how to do it. You're going to sign off saying that you've been trained, but after that you're on your own. Um, but again, some of the schools may require that you staff the units or you provide an attendant with it as well. Awesome. Thank have, you for that. Oh, I have a question now. Um, is it okay if I can ask? Yes. Yeah, man. It's here okay, for you, sorry. man. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt yeah. anybody. Um, okay. So I have an event coming up um, July 2nd. It's, for, it's called Freedom Festival. Um, and I'm being hired by their committee or whatever like that. And they're, they have people staffing it that are coming in and staffing it. So that I'm like, not sure. Cause you were just talking about policies. <laughs> I'm like, I might be talking to you about getting a policy with you, even though I already have one. Um, so if they're staffing it, then that means that I'm kind, I'm, then I'm more off the hook then. If, yeah, if there was an injury. Yeah. But the thing is they have to, there must be documentation that you train them on how to run that unit. So right. it's not just like, Oh, it's not the rental agreement have a, an itemized list of rules. I understand that I've been shown how to turn off the unit. You know, I understand what to do if it gets too windy above this wind percent or this wind speed. Um, having that initialed and documented that they've signed off and they understand how to run that unit correctly is going to be the ultimate get out of jail card. Okay. Um, so again, like the, the staff, right? Exactly. And okay. you, again, it, you still have the accident policy. You always have that to fall back on. So whether it was your fault or not, it's a no fault policy. doesn't matter. If, if it happened on your equipment, I am so sorry that that happened. 
please go to the doctor. Here's this accident policy. Um, the schools will love that. Most schools have a student accident policy, um, whether or not it covers them 24 seven or during these types of festivals, that's a different question, but most public schools have a student accident policy. So should hopefully have some sort of coverage somewhere. Um, but you know, just keep that in mind is I would absolutely make sure that you sign everything or have the renter sign everything and initial it. That's always better. Cool, thank you. For a policy like that, does your company, like, where would you find something like that? You, you were breaking up a little bit. For the policy that you were saying um, to have them, like to train them, now, the insurance part, like would the insurance company provide that or is that something that you just kind of have to write up? So I put in the in the chat here, just like a basic for like a, a okay. rental agreement. It has, I think on the second or third page, it has just the basic you know rule list basically that they would have to sign off on. So use that as an example, but you want to have that for every single type of equipment that you have. So if you have a bounce house, it's going to have a different set of rules for a water slide, right? So just whatever type of equipment that you have, make sure that your rule set within your rental agreement matches the equipment that's being rented. Okay, cool. The other Thank thing you. I wanted to mention is the, the SIOTO training um, has a module that covers that piece. And there's some new enhancements that are gonna cover other inflatables such as water slides, obstacles, and combos. Uh, it's a great point. Thanks for covering that out, Alex. With that, let's go real quick because I know we went pretty long. It seems like we still got a lot of people did you, here. Let's, did you put a link in? The, you said you put a link in. I'm oh, sorry. Did you say you put a link in the chat for the waiver or the insurance? It should just be, yeah, just a document. Hopefully it's there for everybody to see. I thought I shared it to everyone. I did see it there. I don't, okay. I don't know if, if it's not, a, I think because I'm on the phone. Ah, uh, Okay. Depending on when we came in, I came in about 20 minutes late. I don't see it in the chat for me. Either. Okay. If you guys put in uh, once this, if you guys uh, uh, just comment anywhere on Facebook, we'll we'll, we'll find you or message me. I'll get mm -hmm. it to you. If you guys have me on Facebook. I have all the links. Um, Tariq, you have some uh, contracts and stuff or samples on your site too, don't you? Yeah. 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 Okay. And here's I have some, I have some too, actually. Okay. Okay. So we got we got samples everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like Alex said, you know, it's, it's a starting point. Um, I had to recently do something for, for that hawk and, and the lawyer was like, well, if you give me a sample, it'll cost you a lot less than if I had to start from scratch. So I went out and I got, <laughs> so it, it makes sense. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, it's, it's just something to start out with. Um, but I know that we've gone a little bit uh, for a while. So real quick, Brian, I know you have to run. Tell us a little bit about, uh, um, you said Corona, Brian's with Corona Bounce. How can uh, people reach you if they have questions about Corona Balance or learning more about purchasing inflatables from you? Uh, they can reach me at, um, at 951 Corona Balance on my Facebook or um, just add me on Brian Sarmientos on Facebook or call me at 951-463-0650 or coronabounce.com. Send a message there. And, you know, I'll be, uh, I'm always on Facebook. So that's probably the easiest way to contact me or through a text or a phone call. But uh, I wanted to take a quick minute. I learned a lot today, man. I was telling Tariq earlier, man, I did a lot of rookie mistakes when I started in this rental business. Whew, I saved a few, <laughs> punched a few bullets there. <laughs> so, you know, um, got me sweaty when I started hearing insurance already. I was like, oh, I, I don't remember hearing any of that. But um, yeah, I thank you guys for all the information, for having me. I got to go back, got to get that machine working. Got, a, got another crew coming in to cut. So uh, we're staying busy. Um, yeah, thanks for everything. Thanks for the support. Thanks for adding me. Hopefully, I have, next time we do this is on a weekend so I can drink a beer with Alex and anyone else. <laughs> All right, guys. That's about it, man. Thanks so much for everything. Thank you, Brian. Anybody needs Brian's info, message me as well, and I'll, uh, I'll message me on Facebook and I'll get it over to you. Appreciate uh, it, guys. Bye. Thanks, Brian. Let's go to uh, Steve. Steve, you've been very patient. Tell us about Sayoto. Uh, Steve has the... Uh, it's training courses, safety courses for inflatables. How can we learn more about what you do? Uh, I see you put the... Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I posted our link. Uh, you guys can visit us at sayoto.org. Um, and then if you guys want to email us, it's sayotoorg at yahoo.com. 
there's a lot of great training that's going to be able to add a lot of value uh, to your delivery. Uh, some of you guys were talking about quality and, and lowering prices and offering premium services. If you share with your customers that training that you and your team have gone through, it allows you to build value and maintain your prices, which will also allow you to separate yourself from the competition. In addition to that, the insurance companies will also appreciate that and, and, and be able to quote you out accordingly. I've seen that emblem, that logo, that Scioto certified on, on some websites. So definitely thank you for that. Again, anybody who is on Facebook, I can get you guys the Steve's information uh, after this. Nick, what do you want to tell us about what you do? Uh, how can we reach you? I know you're big on YouTube. How can we find you to learn more about everything you're teaching? Yeah, definitely YouTube uh, has been probably the best avenue. And then Facebook Messenger, I get tons of those. And then I'm, for whatever reason, I've always been a big fan of Instagram. You just search me. Um, you can DM me there. I'll answer every single question that comes to me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll go find it out and come back to you. And then um, I also have a Discord. I'll have to drop the, I'll have to drop the link somewhere. But uh, I have a Discord group that I've built out for Bounce House Entrepreneurs specifically. Um, it's growing pretty good. Um, it's a lot of fun in there. So it's like a group chat type of thing. Like Kind of like Facebook group. Uh, I keep it very drama-free in there. Um, and then I've got products that I sell that if you're interested in them, yeah, just hit me up. I'm not here to sell stuff. So if you got questions, send them my way. I will answer all of them. He's being humble. I've seen your videos, man. This guy created his own straps that are for strapping your inflatables. And as soon as I seen him, I'm like, oh man, I wish he had the ones with the, you know, with the, uh, the what do you call them? The little metal things that you can, you know, cause I see the key rings. And the ones with the, uh, what do you call it? The latch or? Yeah, I got them right here. Yeah, these bad boys, they're lashing there straps. You know. Yep, Boom. lashing straps. And they got a little label so you can you can write what the inflatable is. I just sent 10 of these. No, Jana, Jana bought the D-ring ones. I just sent 10 D-ring ones to Jana, but. Those are pretty cool. They they, they, they tie good and uh, and then they have the label where you can write the name of inflatable. That's really, really cool, man, that, that you're doing that. And then yeah, with everything else that you're doing with teaching. So thank you for that. Don't, don't, uh, don't sell yourself short, check his stuff out. <laughs> very, very cool stuff. And you get to support somebody who, who is uh, in your shoes, you know, doing a lot. Uh, he's got, he saw your little sewing machine. So he actually sews this stuff himself. So uh, really, really cool to support somebody that's, that's doing this stuff by hand. Awesome, man. Thank you to what you bring up uh, for the, for the industry. And then uh, last but not least, Alex Casio, how can we reach out to you and learn more about, insurance and ask more questions drive me crazy uh, well full, full disclosure guys if you're trying to reach out right now i apologize i am dying right now trying to keep up uh this time of year it's like trying to drive home in atlanta during rush hour traffic so what should be a pretty straightforward process and if you reached out to us in january we can get it done in a day um, it's taking at least two to three weeks to get something back for a quote. So just want to throw that out there. If you guys are reaching out, I uh, saw so there was a question in the chat about how long it takes to get a quote. Uh, so just please be patient. If you guys have started an application process through the website, that's probably the best path forward. Um, you can get on there. We do have event hawks. So if you guys wanted to get a quick estimate before you start the paperwork process, that is an option available to you. Um, I'd also put my phone number. That's my direct line, by the way. So if you, know, you wanted to go straight to the source, that's the number to call. Um, if I don't pick up, um, please leave me a voicemail and I'm happy to give you a call back, but you have to leave a voicemail because I get a lot of spam calls too. So I don't know if it's you or if it's some other, you know, telemarketer trying to sell me something. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, the website is probably the best way, but Facebook, um, I try to make myself available. I'm really behind on DMs there. So I'm not like Nick. <laughs> uh, I'm not super responsive there right now, but Again, just call me. That's probably the best way. I will give you as much time as you need. Um, answer all your questions. That's what we're here for. Um, but uh, we look forward to it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Any, uh, I, you know, these usually go for an hour. We're two hours and still going. So uh, we may have to schedule a part two. Any, any other uh, urgent questions? We will go back. I'm pretty good about going back afterwards uh, and going back to all the comments. Anything that you put in the comments on Facebook, like Nick said, I will get you an answer or answer it myself. 
So uh, at least if you put a comment in, in, uh, in uh, or mention something in the comments, maybe we'll do a video about it or something. But uh, this has been really, really great. Anybody want to have uh, any, any final thoughts, final questions? Hey, uh, I don't know. Can you all hear me real quick? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, I'm so sorry I'm late to this. I got caught up at my daytime job. Uh, is there any way that I can view this video after the event? I came in close to eight o'clock and um, just this last little bit, it gave me some pretty good information. But is there any way that I can rewatch what we've been talk, what you guys have been talking about? I'm really late to the conversation. Yep, we're, we're live on Facebook right now on the Event Hawk Facebook page. So uh, if you go to the Event Hawk Facebook page, even now, you should be able to re rewind. But as soon as we're done here, it'll be live on the page. You can watch it. And I will get it on YouTube eventually. All right. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Any other big questions? Final questions, final thoughts? What Thank other you thought, guys I guess, time. the uh, Scioto thing, uh, Steve, just you, you kind of brushed it quickly, but as far as the insurance companies, they really do like that Scioto training uh, for you guys that are just starting out. You're just trying to find a way to get a discount. Scioto is one of those ways to get one. So you got to take the full course and get the certificate and then send it with the application. So that way we could apply that discount for you. Thanks, Alex. All right, well, guys, this has been amazing to say the least. Thank you, uh, everybody, for helping me co-host this. Thank you, Brian, who's no longer here. Thank you, Nick, Alex, Steve. You guys have been amazing. Seriously, uh, it's nice to have some help. I usually do these by myself, so uh, I'm sure we'll be. I'll be reaching out to you guys to to, to do some collabs soon. Thank you to everybody who who uh, joined us on Zoom and participated, asked questions, and then thank you to everybody else uh, watching us on Facebook and uh, and hopefully in the future YouTube. Comments, 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 guys. We'd love to bring you guys knowledge. This is our passion. Uh, you know, we could be hanging out right now, but we'd, we'd rather be hanging out with you guys. And like I tell everybody, uh, the alternative is telling my wife all this stuff. And I don't think we'd be married for much longer if I keep talking to her about business. All the different ideas that go through my head every day. She's like, can we just talk about us? I'm like, this is us. This is me. You know, this is what goes <laughs> out of my head every day. So uh, this is good for this. Is, this is good for my, uh, this is my, my, my counseling, my therapy here. So uh, love you guys. You guys are awesome. Keep up the great work. Keep growing. Keep sharing your growth. And then we'll, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.